in the uh, we probably shouldn't have. Yeah, we didn't want to have that conversation in the broadcast. Mm-mm. No. Um, for that one. And we have to do something else, and we'll just we, do it now before anybody's blurb? here. I'll play the blurb. There we and go. Try not to make faces <laughs> while I play it. Anyway. Faith, as scripture tells us, comes from hearing. And so at 1517, audibly proclaiming the gospel to individuals like you is the very heart of what we do. Our podcast network was created so that the gospel would always be within earshot, in your car, on a walk, at your office, at home, or anywhere else. No matter where you are, we want you to know that God now gives you His peace on account of Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross. Over the past three years, we've developed nearly 20 different shows on everything from biblical commentary to cultural engagement, theological discussions, and guided explorations of the confessions. In every case, the laser focus is forgiveness, life, and salvation for you through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And the impact? The impact is that we hear a steady stream of thankfulness from a truly remarkable group of listeners. Listeners new and old to the Christian faith. Listeners from across the generations, across denominations, and across the world. In fact, with you in mind, we are also thrilled to launch our newest podcast, A Field Guide to the Bible, with the first 17 episodes available today. This series will provide a broad overview of the entire Bible, especially designed for those who are brand new to the Bible or those who want to review the grand narrative of redemption. Join us in celebrating and extending the reach of the 1517 Podcast Network by making a gift today. You can learn more about our network and make a donation at 1517.org slash celebrate. All right. There we go. There's your... There's your ad. I don't know. I, I, I'm really grateful for all the music on these advertisements because I, otherwise I wouldn't know how to feel. <laughs> well, Caleb actually sent me, uh, we're not live, we're not Morning, recording Paul. yet. Um, Caleb sent me a note. He's like, what music should, where can I get music for it? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I sent him, I don't remember where I sent him. I'm like, you know, you're the guy in charge. You should know. Right. We're me. just the drones in Sector C. We don't, we're the IT crowd. We're in the basement. So, but it did just get me, get me thinking. Uh, when did we start this show? October. Uh, the first episode dropped April 10th, 2018. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So did we go live before the thir- three year, before the network went live? I think so. We were actually before the network. Yeah, we were. We are the network. Yeah. Because I oh. think Thinking Fellows was going and then they asked us to do oh, Lutheran. And, well, and Dan and Jeff had their show that had been going for a bit. Well, that's right. Virtue in the Wasteland was there too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was kind of the first. Those two were kind of like the OGs. And then you and I were doing a different podcast and like, we want you to do that over here. And we're like, or how about this? We'll just do something different entirely. And the rest is is history. All right. So Paul's here. Aaron's here. Hi, yeah. Paul. Hi, Aaron. Hi, S. Simon. S- Simon. S- all right, so is that Steve, right? So let's, uh, you know, do the war chant. Do Fair it. Enough? Okay. I got to hit record. Hold on. Oh, yeah, well, let's do that first. Hold on. <laughs> Jeez. High class establishment here. How long have we been doing this? <laughs> I don't know. All right, there we go. War chant. Louder. Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. This is the Band Book Podcast, episode number 200, and it doesn't matter. And mm. as always, we are your host, Christopher Gillespie. Chillin' and Willin', Maxin' and Relaxin'. And I am Don Riley. Uh, yes, aggressively gentlemanly. Yeah, I'm wearing my now defunct mercenary audio t-shirt I found nice. in my drawer. I like it. I like the, the slogan on the back is my favorite. We're not happy till you're not happy, which is kind of my life slogan. I was going to say that, that that could actually be transferred over to this show. So. <laughs> We're just Welcome upsetting to every... the Doomsayer show. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Any any Anything that you took pleasure or, or hoped in um, <laughs> will be right. soon destroyed. That's right. That's right. What is that? That's your dream stuck to the bottom of our shoe. <laughs> walk all over you walk all over it There's today on the podcast we are well we discussed it but today we're going to actually start doing it probably most likely 
Um, we're going to spend the summer um, going through, uh, well, atheists. Oh, and not just right. atheists, talk about them. but folks that critiqued the Christian faith, the Christian religion of their era. And today we're going to start with my absolute favoritist atheist ever, Friedrich Nietzsche. And uh, someone that I've invested an immense amount of personal time in the last six months, seven months. Yeah, yeah, you have. Constant daily reading and study of Nietzsche because he has so much to say to today's social dynamic, I guess is the best way to say it, uh, globally too. And also, um, even as I preached yesterday, he has a lot to say to the church today. Well, the, and, the question is always with, with the atheist, what, what mm -hmm. God are you actually rejecting? Right, exactly. Right. And, and we, what we find out, I think what we will find out as mm -hmm. we look at, at these atheists is that the God they reject is actually a God we reject too. Right. And, and this is something that being a former atheist, it's, it's always been uh, a subtext of, of my life is talking with other people about how I came to believe not only in God, but in Christ in particular as my Savior as God and Savior. And then over the years, also going back and reading folks like Nietzsche that I read when I was an atheist in high school mm -hmm. and college, and then coming back around and saying, you know, maybe I was a little bit too glib in my post-conversion attitude towards some of these atheists. And maybe they have a lot to teach me and us in the present tense to call us to repentance. One of our old friends, uh, Bill Swirla, once said to us that sometimes God uses atheists to tear down our idols. Wow. And, and I think that's, that's the key thing about a guy like Nietzsche, uh, Ludwig Feuerbach, who we've mentioned on the show before, and others, even Christopher Hitchens, which I'm sure we'll probably read this summer. Yeah, I was wondering if he would be on the list. <clears throat> did you did you ever watch the film that he did with um, uh, Doug Douglas, what's his name? The guy out in Moscow, Idaho, Moscow, Idaho uh, mm. the reformed guy. They did, they did a, a lecture, not a lecture series, a debate um, circuit thing, and then they filmed Actually, it. I think I just saw one of the clips last week. It showed up on my YouTube recommendations because I was listening, I was watching uh, Hitchens interviews. I mean, they're, they're both intellectuals, they're both thinking <clears throat> men, and they want to interact with others. They're not, but they're also a little, uh, what do you want to say, aggressive, uh, you know, mm -hmm. intense, yeah. Uh, yeah. which means that they got along just splendidly, right? Right, right. <laughs> you know, because it wasn't that there were no rules, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know they they saw it they saw it more like we were talking about before we went on air more of like a wrestling match or a dance or mm -hmm. yeah like they knew that they probably weren't going to convince each other of each other's position right. but they wanted to they actually wanted to hone each other's arguments and, mm -hmm. and get to the essential argument right you know to the essential points mm -hmm. well and christopher's brother peter who's still alive mm -hmm. he did actually convert back so to speak to the faith yeah but what you discover when you read like Christopher Hitchens work then and his critique, because there's debates between him and his brother, which essentially go nowhere because they're brothers. <laughs> but what you discover that is that the church of England and the God of the church of England, uh, is not a God I could ever believe in to be nope. blunt. Nope. And so Christopher's rejection of his childhood upbringing in the faith, you, it's just checking those boxes of, of like not Christological, not incarnational, not sacramental, in an incarnational sense, their vocation isn't God right. working in and through you. There's no language of instrumentality. And like with Peter, just, and I'm not doing him, you know, the service due to him, but quick and dirty is just, Peter is very much a political theologian now. Yeah, yeah. His politics and his religion, in my experience of, of watching his lectures and interviews, they're, they're not really distinguishable. They're more like overlapping things. Well, like we've talked about, the, the problem with theology, as you um, allow or even encourage it to engage in daily life, mm -hmm. is that it, it does kind of blur those lines. It makes it a little bit hard to distinguish, like, um, well, you hold a conservative ethical position, but that ethic is worked out in political life. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of hard to distinguish between the two. I was thinking yeah. of another example that uh, is interesting. Oh, the um, debate with um, uh, the Monty Python guys and... It was specifically um, Cleese with mm -hmm. with actually the bishop that the, he was now bishop, but he was his priest growing up, hmm. Anglican priest, and the two of them arguing about. I think it was specifically Life of Brian was the context, mm -hmm. and saying whether this kind of religious satire was helpful. And, and Cleese, you know, drives pretty close. He says, "Look, if you can't make fun of yourself, 
right. then you fail to see the absurdity of what you believe. Right. And I'm like, well, that's pretty <clears throat> profound because we wouldn't yeah. call it absurd. We call it mysterious, but um, I call it absurd though too because yeah. Tertullian was it? We said I believe because it's absurd. It, well, it is unbelievable. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Right. Yeah, that's what absurd is. Yeah. And if you so if you and you can't then see your see your blind spots the things that maybe you can't uh, demonstrate through like say um, you know the whole discipline of apologetics right? right which which doesn't explain everything it it helps in some regards but it doesn't help in it other walks places to the door right but it but it can't explain you know why did God become man right you can try mm -hmm. to do it <laughs> there have been right. many who have um, but in the end it's believed. Yeah. Well, I think in Nietzsche's case, in going forward from the Enlightenment and Industrial Revolution into the 20th century, something to appreciate as we read this essay by Terry Eagleton, who is very Capon-esque, actually, in some of his turns of phrase. But if you look at rationalism, orthodoxy, romanticism, and pietism, each one of these attempts to objectify an aspect of, of the person. So like rationalism objectifies knowledge, orthodoxy objectifies theology, romanticism objectifies feelings, and pietism objectifies experience. And what you see then in each one of these movements that comes out of this, this time is the attempt to make material, again, so you're, you're, you're attempting to, to, to make, you objectify something materially and, and what ends up happening is the mystery is lost, the absurdity mm, is lost, okay. because you're trying to justify, to your point, your faith, your belief in, in, a, in a cultural context that might be hyper, um, in, like hyper antagonistic toward the Christian religion. So like Nietzsche famously says then is that materialism, which is part of the death of God, materialism will lead us to nihilism, because as we're about to read and we get it from materialism to capitalism, it has no God, but we will then erect gods in place of God yeah. and we'll parrot the theology, we'll parrot the worldview, we'll parrot the ritual, but, in the, but it's all hollow because there's no actual faith behind any of it. There's no actual God. And therefore, the more we attempt to rationalize and objectify physical reality in ourselves, the worse it's actually going to become. Hmm, hmm. which is, you know, that's why Nietzsche essentially predicts that the 20th century will be the century of genocide because materialism leads to nihilism and nihilism leads to, I don't believe that there's any ultimate purpose to my life or your life. And therefore, if you're in my way, right, I'm just going to sweep you out of the way. You know, I'm, I'm listening to a podcast on the Armenian genocide right now, which is kind of the, you know, quote unquote, the oh, first it actually is genocide. a genocide now. <laughs> oh, have we I mean, accepted that? Um, actually, of all Popularly things, speaking, uh, Joseph... Uh, Robinette Biden actually made it, declared it, at least as a country, uh, United States recognizes it as genocide now, which made well, Turkey upset we were with timely. us. timely. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting that it's taken this long. I mean, because Obama refused to, Trump didn't mm -hmm. really want to get involved. Because yeah. um, there's there's political ramifications. I don't know why you want to make Turkey your enemy. That's a, always a question to ask. Right. But anyway. Right. Well, it's just, it's a, such a strange thing. Like you talked about yesterday, or you sent that to me yesterday, is the, the whole idea of statehood doesn't really originate until like this, the 16th century. Yeah, late 16th even. Late 16th century. So Post 30 years war, almost. Yeah. yeah. Where you're like, oh, that seems odd. I thought we always took it for granted. But the point is, like, you look at the Ottoman Empire. It really wasn't a monolithic consolidation of power under one caliphate because there wasn't mass communication. There wasn't mass transit. So like in the Armenian genocide, you have an Armenian village way out at the edge of the quote unquote empire. And maybe every four or five years, a group of guys would ride into town and say, listen, I need 10 men. Right. They're going to come and be, you know, they're going to come and be our slaves and work for the bureaucracy. And if you don't do it, we're going to burn down your whole village and kill everybody. Um, well, I mean, even in the scripture that the taxation that was at the birth mm -hmm. of Christ, that time of taxation, right. Rome, Rome didn't tax all the time. They, no. they taxed when they had a major like building project or right. something like that. Yeah, kind it of like was, in the United States. Well, <laughs> up until no, the first time the first time we had a federal tax was uh, for army, right? That's what I'm saying. Yes, to raise military. Yeah, correct. Yes, which is why then, following World War II, we declared that we were constantly at war to justify. So we could constantly permanent tax people. Tax. Yeah, that's not conspiratorial, by the way. That's well, why it the Cold War was, it's not that's a why it was declared the Cold War, and then when that failed, we had the war on drugs, and then that Everything. failed, so we had the war on terror. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Now it's the war, the trials. war on white supremacy or something. And now the war that. on anti-vaxxers. Oh, is that <laughs> oh, the war on whatever? <laughs> I'll find it's, some reason to keep taking your money, right? Right. So then, what we're going to read today is from uh, November two thousand eight uh, essay slash. Um, I don't know what you know, say the delivery speech, whatever it is, by Terry Eagleton. Called I looked Nietzsche him up. In Christ, yeah. He's got an interesting bio. Um, it says here, this is just Wikipedia, mm -hmm. but English literary theorist, no problem there, critic and public intellectual. So like in the vein of Lewis, right? Mm -hmm. um, known for his literary theory and introduction, 1983, which sold 750,000 copies. Whoa. So, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, this is hmm. not like some, I mean, he's at University of Oxford, English no, literature. Not a lightweight. He is not a lightweight and it does have that, um, interaction with Dawkins, Hitchens, and the New Atheism. Cool. So he got, he was a critic of it, actually. I would assume so based on the essay that we're mm -hmm. about to read. And no. for those of you who are curious, we'll post the link, obviously. It's only five pages. It's actually a very quick read if you just want to read through it you know, and just get what you can from kind of first blush. Um, I spent a couple of weeks with this now because I keep going the picture, over stuff. The picture of him, he's got a scarf so and a beard. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's, he's English. What? Mm. <laughs> he's the chair of a department of English with creative and creative writing. Yeah. And he, and he loves, he loves Victorian literature. Come on. This is definitely going to have a scarf. I mean, if it was Shemog, I could give him a pass, but a scarf is like one step away from an ascot at that point. I mean, just, just do it. <laughs> just embrace what you're doing. Um, what is a I cultural do... theorist anyway? What does that even mean? That there's like a, a theory of culture? No, it's like a, <laughs> that's like a person that can't have a job, that lives in a van. <laughs> <laughs> Not with shag carpet, though. No, no. Well, sometimes. But as long as it, it, long as it kind of matches up with the faux wood paneling and the crystals. One of the things my wife and I do for fun is we watch uh, van life videos and notice all the 21 through 23-year-old young women who uh, fund their life by being life coaches or fitness gurus or something. I'm like, you're 23. Like, what can you teach me about life from the back of a van at 23 years old? Again, I know that's presumptuous. It's probably arrogant and condescending of me. I'm just saying there's not a lot mm. of 23-year-olds I've met who have a lot of life experience that they can coach me. Well, I mean, by definition, it's nearly impossible to have wisdom at that age. Right. <laughs> you haven't failed enough to be wise. But nonetheless, uh, I think part of it's just my jealousy and resentment that they get to live the life I want. <laughs> okay, so cultural theory is applying... Um, basically, this, the uh, ob, you know standard ob objective scientific theories upon mm -hmm. anthropology, specifically right. um, language, mm -hmm. behavior, mm -hmm. these sort of things. So looking at, at different cultural um, right. context in a scientific kind of way and then trying to mm -hmm. find patterns, of course. Right. Yep. Right. We were actually talking about this before we went on air, didn't mm -hmm. we? We were, exactly. Patterns of dance and these sort of yes. you know, mating rituals. Yes, you and I are also highly of... unemployable in a normal job that contributes to society in a positive way. Yeah, I'm surprised that, yeah, that I... <laughs> <laughs> can't argue, check. can't argue. <laughs> Periodically, yeah. That's why you and I it's created separate industries for ourselves. Where one fails, the other That's will correct. fail too. It's like, well, you're not really mm -hmm. useful at, at this, so how about that? Thank well, you. Well, it's when you it's when you overstay, over, uh, overstay your welcome or... Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is Nietzsche and Christ from November 23rd, 2008, Trinity College by Terry Eagleton. Have you not heard of that madman who lit a lantern in the bright morning hours, ran to the marketplace and cried incessantly, I seek God. I seek God. Whither is God? He cried. I will tell you, we have killed him. You and I. All of us are his murderers. God is dead. God remains dead and we have killed him. There has never been a greater deed, and whoever is born after us, for the sake of this deed, he will belong to a higher history than all histories hitherto. Now, on the surface, I think you and I would say, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's Good Friday. That's basically what we confess on Good Friday. Luke I kind of feel like we need a soundtrack for this, don't you? Right? <laughs> what would it be, though? I don't know. Yeah. Just keep going. Yeah. Luke 23, verses 44 through 46 then. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. While the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, 
Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. <laughs> that was perfect. That was, thank you're welcome. <laughs> right, That's why we're, we're professionals, people. Do not attempt this at home. Oh. All right, you got the idea. So Nietzsche's opposition on the surface, just flat statement here from these two quotes at the beginning of Eagleton's article, is that the, the, the Christianity of his day taught that God the Father essentially was responsible for deicide in mm. the sense of it was really between Jesus and his dad. And oh, patricide, a, right? Yeah. And then okay. to a lesser extent, the Jews, right? The Jews killed Jesus, but it was really ultimately, it was between Jesus and his dad. But but and, Jews in a in a, a Semitic kind of way, right? Correct, that it was a racial kind of pejorative culture. sense. Yes. Okay. All right. Whereas Nietzsche is saying, mm, according to the biblical testimony, this is the thing. Nietzsche was a pastor's kid. His dad died actually when he was five, and he was raised by five overbearing women. But in high school and then into college, he was actually a theology tract major. He started a theological club at the university. So he's not an atheist in the sense of I hate all things Christian from my birth. He mm-hmm. was kind of a Pharisee of Pharisees in a Pauline sense. He was a theological nerd. And therefore, yeah. his opposition to Christianity of his day comes, I think, out of that. And he does have a kind of Luther's come to Jesus moment in the storm. It's just that Nietzsche's come to Jesus moment caused him to apostatize and, and engage in a heavy, heavy regimen of wine, women, and song. When which I led think, to syphilis, which is ultimately what killed him. But uh, you can maybe understand, you know, what he's going to be rejecting. Uh, mm-hmm. If you go back and read the cape, do the cape in episodes on, right. uh, we did that like way back at the beginning. So it would have been 2018, mm-hmm. I guess now. Yeah. Uh, where we went through how many episodes? Like 14 episodes, maybe? Something like that, yeah. Uh, yeah, we're talking about uh, not not the Christian faith, but uh, I guess Christianity or what was is that 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 was his critique right christianity mm-hmm. is like the inst, not the institution that christ sets up but the institution that we build up around it i Correct. guess is what you would say right you know and, right. and that that often um you know as it as it develops i guess or it really mm-hmm. seems like it seems like sediment layers you know <laughs> that are on top of the the original foundation yes and that it obscures the obscures the the reason why we're here in the first place right and uh yeah. Something that we uh, we discussed and addressed in confirmation yesterday on mm. the Lord's Supper, the sacrament of the altar, is the wor- the the whole question of where is this written in Scripture, <laughs> according you know, and and how much communion practice is writ- not written in Scripture exactly, and yeah. and because my kids, the way that I primarily teach is through breaking words down, because the word institute, for example, ten year olds look at you and go what, <laughs> right. Um, and I want them to understand because someday they're going to drive say, past like, a building that says this is the Institute for Science or the this is the Agricultural Institute. Well, you can't and even say like, it's like the man. That's because that's now what dated fifty year reference. One hundred percent. And so once you break down Institute, meaning to put in place that Jesus mm-hmm. puts in place this thing. To your point, when we talk about Christian institutions, we're referring specifically to the institution of the Lord's Supper by Jesus on the on the night in which he was betrayed. Or, the, or, yeah, the other ones like go and make disciples by baptizing correct, and teaching. Right, these are right. literally instituted. They're put in place by Jesus, mm-hmm. by his command and promise. Preach the gospel, forgive right. the sins. The sediment is yeah. the old Adam saying, well, that's simple. How can I complicate this further? And what I teach my kids is, you know, when we talk about original sin, for example, or sin in general, sin is selfishness, self-centeredness. I ask the question, is this simple? Yes. It's the words of institution. It's a paragraph. Easy to memorize, easy to grasp. This is my body. This is my blood. Do this. And I asked the kids, okay, now based on what you understand about the word sin and we're sinful, why do you think we then take something so simple that Jesus institutes, this is the institution that makes the church the church, and why do we add all this other stuff? Because then you get in, the, in our catechism, you get to who is it who is worthy and well prepared to receive this. Mm-hmm, right. Again, very simple actually. He who believes these words given and shed for you is worthy and well prepared because he receives what they give, forgiveness, life, and eternal salvation. I'm like, do you understand this? They're like, of course, it's simple. (laughs) I'm like, then 
why do we try and make it so complicated? Why do we? And, and they all immediately go, control. These are 10 year olds who are like immediately like control. <laughs> well, and this is the the funny part when people say, well, what does it mean to be examined and absolved, right? Which is yeah. the, uh, you know, not from a small catechism, but from Augsburg. Mm -hmm. But anyway, examined. Well, what do you believe according to these words? Right. What's given and shed for me for the right. forgiveness of sins? Okay. Right. There we go, right? And then we take that examination. He's like, well, that that word could mean a lot more, right? right? We could answer. Uh, yes, it, 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 it goes from. That. I explained it this way: Do you believe is means is? Yes, good to go. Second step. Okay, I've got these twenty-one or twenty-two questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Christian questions and answers, and we do ten of them for our confession Sunday right. mornings in our liturgy, right? So that we are examining and confessing. Mm -hmm. And we go from that to like Leia's catechism, which has over 900 questions. <laughs> which is fine. Which is, again, I enjoy the questions in Leia's catechism. I just don't believe it's very responsible for us to expect everybody to have memorized all 900 questions. Well, and when you really get into challenges are those, you know, who maybe have a uh, mental or physical handicap. Correct. You know, mm -hmm. and you're like, well, we have yes. this criteria that we established for majority of people, but we Correct. can't apply it uniformly to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, nor, nor it does not seem responsible to do that, mm -hmm. um, especially since Jesus didn't actually command them, right? Correct. Or so why do standard. we, and this comes back around, by the way, all of those questions in, in that in Leia's era are a consequence of rationalism, orthodoxy, pietism, and romanticism. And that's why right, by well, the time it gets to the United States, especially in the 20th century, there's so much flotsam and jetsam and detritus on admittance to the Lord's Supper that it becomes impenetrable for most people. Well, but in one sense, I mean, the Lord's Supper is different than, say, something like baptism, which Luther also did something to, right? I mean, it had, mm -hmm. there were like seven things, right, that you had to do in addition to the washing, washer, washing with water and word. There were the spit and the yeah, sticking the fingers in their ears or something. And ears and, and whiskers. I don't remember, and oils and all sorts of stuff. Rubbing them in dirt. Salt. And, there was yeah. something with salt, too. I don't right. know. Punting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> holding the baby up like Simba, right, shaking you know. the baby upside down to get the demons out oh i think that's part of it too yeah salt right, and it's like okay that's not part of the that's obviously no. not part of the ritual no and there's do they really destroy the the sacrament of baptism probably not but it certainly doesn't help faith not from god's side of things no 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 um whereas with the sacrament of the altar it is different in that we do have some admonition to receive it um that we can receive it to our hurt and harm so right so that's why we're a little bit more cautious a lot more cautious i suppose well right but here, here's my point. You talked about all these questions. It's just mm -hmm. like the creeds, that all the questions, just like all the statements in the creeds, are responding to something that right. largely we don't know anything about anymore. Right. Leia, William, w Wilhelm Leia, or William Loa, or just William Lowe, if Billy, English. Billy. Billy, Billy Lowe. Hold on a um, second. He's responding to rationalism, orthodoxy. He's responding to strains of pietism and early strains of romance. Uh, that guy. There he is. Yep. In fact, I'm the one who translated and updated his catechism. <laughs> you all have no a picture of him in your office, right? No one wanted to buy. I, do. I mean, well, I mean, good, I do. Good looking guy. Because his book on pastoral care is pretty awesome. But um, three books on the church too. But our church body's not a big fan of him. So <laughs> historically, even though he's the founder he and, of our church body, <laughs> he and CFW Walther uh, had a little tete a tete. Um, which is entirely Walther's fault, by the way. And I know the entire side story of that by way of another. Uh, spiritual father of mine, Ken Corby, that uh, Walther actually had Kirke und Amt in his saddlebags when he met with Leia when he went to Europe and didn't share that with Leia and then came back and went, he's a uh, anti sacerdotal. It's like, what a dork. Yeah. What a dork. Yeah. Well, it's it the same like, thing with Buffalo was, Synod because Buffalo yeah. came out of Leia and yeah. Right. And Anyways, they grab before out. Everybody yeah. passes out. But <laughs> I just said to you yesterday, I'm like, I hate inside baseball conversation. And then we're doing it. But um, the <clears> point <throat> is then that it's pretty simple. Paul's pretty simple. Right mm -hmm. in Corinthians, he's like, "Listen, this is essentially why you shouldn't do this." It's a sentence. They were, well, they, they were using it for gluttony or for drunkenness. Right, exactly. Like, don't and and they and they they were a divided congregation. They refused mm -hmm. to reconcile, Correct. and yet they would still receive the supper together. Right. So that's that's and very straightforward. Very straightforward. Paul is again to your point. Paul is reacting to something very specific and saying, "No, knock that off. That is not the worthy way to receive the Lord's supper." Mm -hmm. Right. The fact that I have to tell you to not use the, Jesus's blood to get drunk. And all the things that they engaged with as a consequence of their drunkenness, because it wasn't yes. just it wasn't just dinner in a movie. Let's put it that way, folks. Um, it was Corinth in the first century. <laughs> um, yeah, Corinth was a fun place. 
Yeah, depending on, yeah, depending on what you were there then, for. When I did the Bible study on this, I had no idea that the way that they established the temples is all mm -hmm. the temple rituals, which were largely sex cults, yeah. were, were on like the second floor. The first floor, and it involved food too. Yeah, The course. first floor, they just functioned like a restaurant. Yeah. And so the, after the, the ritual food was used on the second floor, they bring it down to the first floor and you'd have dinner. And you're yeah. like, I mean, what's going on upstairs? Yeah. Right. Oh, by the way, if you want to know what meat sacrifice to idols entails... <laughs> Yeah. That that would be it, my friends. Yeah, yeah whether it's, it's a restaurant or or more of like a you know. A, yeah, it's not just. Market. Hey, we had this meat left over from our sacrifice at the Temple of Apollo last night, and we're going to sell that to raise money to pay the bills. I always use no. the the strange the strange experience I had when I visited the Hindu temples, yeah. and uh, as we're walking out, they're like they have this counter, and the mm. and the person's like take take some of this fruit, and there's like piles mm. of fruit because they had been yeah. sacrificing to the the gods mm -hmm. there. And they're like, just right. take this fruit. And I'm like, oh, this is fruit sacrificed to idols. I could pray over it or I could say I'm not hungry. I don't know. Right. So I just So you out. picked it up and threw it at them, right? <laughs> oh, I should have. They were, I, I distinctly remember bananas. I don't know why, but sure. there were bananas. So in also <laughs> Shrock of Zarathustra, which is what Nietzsche's, that's the quote that we read here about God is dead. Right. Um, he wrote that. At, it's really much the last thing he wrote before he died because mm. he went insane. But um, the, his point then is that Zarathustra is a play on Zoroaster. And oh, okay. Yeah, so he's also doing a history of religious studies within the context of this kind of fable of this person who's actually himself, but not him coming down off the mountain and encountering people going down, and then he goes into this village and he encounters the people in the village. And it's, it's a fascinating read, actually, if you, if you want to read it. Because this wise man comes down off the mountain to basically warn them. And when he gets to the village, they think he's the acrobat that they've hired to entertain them. Oh, and wow. so everything he says, they laugh at. And they're like, you're funny. Now do the high wire thing. And then even after the acrobat comes out and he's like, no, I'm the acrobat. Then they're like, well, who's this guy? He's like, I've come to warn you that you're doomed. And they're like, you are. Oh, you're the, you're the, you're the opening act. You're the joke. And they laugh at him. And that's Nietzsche's point is that to come down and say, we killed God, they're going to laugh in your face and treat you as a clown, basically, because they refuse to listen to the truth, because they just want to be entertained. Hmm. Yeah, nothing relevant about that or contemporary at all. Hmm. Hmm. And so hmm. the conceit there is, we killed God, stop trying to, again, his point is, stop trying to unload responsibility for the death of God on God, because the scripture is clear, we killed God. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. We killed God. Second, I'm telling you this and you're not going to listen to me. You're not going to believe it. But think about what he's saying then. He's saying to a Christian culture in Germany, for example, we killed God. The way that we've been taught about the death of Jesus on the cross is wrong. And I can prove it from scripture itself, which to, G, you know, to Luke and that quote from Luke. So Nietzsche is actually being more biblically orthodox than the Christian church of his day. It's interesting because, you know, um, he came to his own, but his own did not receive him, right? That, yeah. that language. Mm -hmm. uh, but to, was that first John? But those to those who received him, I can't remember. He gave the power to become, no, it's John chapter one. Oh, it's John one. That's right. Yeah. And, um, you know, he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. And isn't that a description of like what we we're just talking about? Jesus mm -hmm. says, here's the institution, right? right. Here's how I'm going to come to you, right? It's simple. Uh, right. And then we say, yeah, but that's not what we want. That's not right. The, that's no, that's not the right. Jesus we want. Right. We want a different Jesus. And you're like, right. but that like, especially like, you know, Paul says, I, I, we preach Christ and him crucified. And then mm -hmm. how many people say to us, I know I don't want Jesus crucified. I want Jesus risen. And you're like, well, but right. if he's not crucified. Then our faith is in right. vain. And you're like, well, that doesn't matter. Yeah. You know? It's like he didn't God have to did die. it to him. The father did it to him. Or really whatever. The father. It's like you said, it's patricide. It's like Nope. <laughs> that's an that's a really I mean, that long predates Nietzsche as far as that mm -hmm. critique. Well that's Luther's critique of the Roman the late medieval Roman Catholic Church. Oh, what they're doing mm -hmm. with the sacrifice of the mass? Yeah, well, different atonement theories. Mm, okay. Like it's the father abandoned Jesus to the cross, so technically it's the father's fault that Jesus died. Which people well, argue it's the against father's to this will. Day. Right, it? it is the Father's will, but it, in Philippians two language, Jesus is the one who chose to do that to himself. And John is John's gospel express Jesus expresses it the same way. I, I do the, what the Father gave me to do. I do it willingly. Exactly. I, right. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down willingly. 
So here we go then. That's the setup <laughs> to this article. We haven't even gotten to the article yet. Yeah, we'll get there. Everyone knows that Nietzsche said God is dead, just as everyone knows that Marie Antoinette said, let them eat cake. And Humphrey Bogart said, play it again, Sam, except that apparently neither of them did. Mm -hmm. She never said it, and that's not in the movie. But if God really is dead then, for a start, who done it? <laughs> not, let's be clear, a lot of hairy left-wing atheists, but a lot of short-haired bankers. Like I said, this is very Capon-esque. In Nietzsche's okay. view, God was done in by those who believed in him, not by those who don't. This is key to the whole thing. This is key to Nietzsche's whole argument. Hmm. God was done in by those who believe in him, not by those who don't. So in a sense, and I'm We talked about this. On. Didn't we talk yeah. about this with uh, Pontius Pilate a couple weeks ago? Yeah. With the yeah. dream. And it's like, Pilate mm -hmm. seems to, uh, you wonder, like, right. what does he actually believe? Because he, he says he's innocent and yet he still kills him. Right. Yeah. But think about the jumping off point then, and, and I've talked about this before, we've talked about this before. If that's the jumping off point, God was done in by those who believe in him, not by those who don't. And then you live in a generation, in an era where the Christian church rejects this. Hmm. In my opinion, the only way to be a truly devout and orthodox Christian is to have nothing to do with the Christian religion, which will lead to you being demonized and vilified as being not Christian. Yeah. by the very institution that rejects the clear scriptural teaching on it was the religious people who killed Jesus, not the non-believers. Isn't that the scandal of confession absolution for us? Yeah, yeah. You know, is that each week we confess, uh, we crucified our Lord. Right. You know, yesterday I read, I, I just spontaneously in the morning decided, well, mostly because I wanted to preach on the second half of Acts chapter 2, which is not a sign for Pentecost. It's not a sign really, I think it's like Lent Why would you optional. do that for Pentecost? <laughs> read the whole chapter the whole yeah. account of pentecost i don't know Crazy. why would i do that well so we only have 60 chapter. minutes well whatever i don't did it. it um but but that's how peter's sermon ends right mm -hmm. you crucified this jesus whom you, whom crucified. you crucified and yeah. then they're like what uh, what so now what <laughs> right yeah <laughs> we crucified exactly. our savior and he says oh repent and um, right be baptized every one of you which right is that jesus never excommunicates himself. He never says, I'm not with you people. Mm, In fact, he says, true. I came to save the lost sheep of Israel and you, Canaanite woman, ain't one of them. He's very clear. And yet they ostracize and marginalize and attempt to assassinate him. Mm -hmm. Not because of his false teaching, but because of his adherence to the truth of, well, his own word, the yeah. truth of scripture. Likewise, you know, Luther, for all of his his idiosyncrasies and failings never sought to be excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church. He did not leave them. They left him. It was mm -hmm. the it was the papal bull of excommunication that he burned famously. Excurgi Domini. Right. They excommunicated him. And then he's like, okay, well I guess there's nothing else to be said. I'm out. But the key then is notice, and this is we've when we were, we were reading the um revivalist preachers too. Mm -hmm. These aren't people, and even when they when they were at their most, you know, violently opposed preaching to the church of their day, they never said, "Let's just pack up and 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 start our own church." It was more along the lines of like, "Okay, if they're not going to be faithful witnesses to the truth of Scripture, then we've got to stop attending those churches, and we've basically got to create." new churches, new congregations. Yeah. I mean, there, there are charlatans mm -hmm. and, uh, of course, right. you know, uh, self-seeking people who are, are looking right. to kind of gain a right. cult following for themselves or something. That's different. And I, and I bring it up because I think you and I have both, well, we've talked about it a lot on the show, but we've both also interacted with a lot of people the past year and a half who've had the same question. Mm -hmm. My church is closed permanently. My church is closed and won't reopen unless the politicians give them permission. My church is open, but there are all these restrictions and guidelines. My they church is open, them. but now yeah. it's segregating between vaccinated and unvaccinated. Yeah, they're burdening consciences. They're burdening consciences. What are we to do? And Matthew Rust, who just signed in, good morning. Um, what are we to do? Well, that is the crisis of conscience is, in Nietzsche's point, I'm going to leave the church of my father because the church of my father rejects the clear teaching of scripture on 
who killed God. Mm -hmm. And the reason they do that is because they're the religious leaders who killed God. And therefore yeah. they stand just as guilty as the religious leaders who stood around the cross and witnessed Jesus being executed. Do you think it'd be fair to summarize it and say there's just no repentance right. within the institutional church of right. his day? Well, this yeah. morning in chapel, we read from Mark chapter uh, 6, Jesus sending out the apostles. Hmm. Is that 5 or 6? Six? 6. I don't know. Right? Somewhere Anyways, right he sends out the department, right? And he says, stay as long as they'll have you. And if they don't, kick the dirt off your feet and move on. Right. It's a curse. Is that you grow up in that and you say to yourself, okay, I'm reading the Bible and I'm studying theology and I'm going to school for a theological degree, but I've kind of run up against this wall. And the wall is the preaching of my church and the confession of my church seems opposed to scripture and the testimony of scripture about the death of Jesus. So I'm going to go to my pastor, I'm going to go to my professors, go to my advisor, go to my peers. I'm going to show them this. And they are constantly trying to qualify and equivocate on this point rather than just acknowledge like, oh, that's a good point. You know, we hadn't really thought about the fact that we've rejected this key feature of the Christian faith. <laughs> and therefore he's sitting there looking at it going, oh, I'm kind of in the same boat that a lot of the disciples were in the first century. That like in the book of Acts at Pentecost, right? the religious leaders don't look at that event and say, well, this is further proof that we were wrong and we need to repent. Instead, it hardens them, no. and they're like, well, no, we're going to kill down. these guys too now. Yeah. It's like, well, we'll just kill everybody who is yeah. down with this Jesus dude, and then we won't have a problem anymore. And if not for Gamaliel and the work of the Spirit through Gamaliel, that's really what would have happened, and Paul and others. I would say Gamaliel, that, but we could say it either way. <laughs> fine. Be that way. G it's, it's a, it's a Greek, Well, it's a Hebrew name. Gamaliel. Yeah, it's written in Greek. <laughs> who even knows? Right. That's fine. Peaches, pears, tomato, tomato, whatever. <laughs> well, it reminds me of Gal Galadriel, right? And then, you know, I'm thinking Galadriel. wizards and yeah, and elves and things. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Now I got that stuck in my head for the rest of my life. <laughs> Rings of power. Gamaliel. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's fine. Now they have to pronounce it Gadariel or... <laughs> Thanks. So to be clear, again, it's not the hairy left-wing atheists, but the short-haired bankers that killed Jesus. God was done in by those who believe in him, not by those who don't. He was murdered by a bunch of impeccably, respectably church-going suburban bourgeois. Woof. Hmm. The, suburban, the suburban housewives killed Jesus no, while their husbands just stood behind them and went, yes, honey, yes, honey. <laughs> not by rationalist, anarchist, militant humanist, and other such disreputable moral louts. Wow. You know, that's a mic drop right there. Well, and they in think my, in this, my opinion, this, he's right. <laughs> this credit, I mean, he was born in like 48, mm -hmm. I think, 43, somewhere in there. So oh, okay. think Church of England, you know. Yeah. Yep. What does it look like? It's the same right. thing. He was murdered by a bunch of impeccably, respectably, church-going, suburban bourgeois. Not by rationalists, not by anarchists, not by militant humanists, not by any kind of dismoral or disreputable moral, you know, scumbags. Right. These are the Sunday best. These are not the people on the highways and byways, as Jesus said. No, says. these are the people in your church on Sundays. Mm -hmm. And your pastors and others. Yeah. So, so what's the deceit that that the uh, uh, the detritus that we were talking about, mm -hmm. that the stuff that builds up over time, mm -hmm. that it ends up becoming the thing? And Correct. Always. And whatever, whatever it was covering or supplementing, I should say, right. um, ends up dying in the process. Right. It's, it's, that, it's that old expression, right? Jesus plus anything equals, you know. Nothing. Nothing, yeah. How is this so? And here we go. Buckle up. <laughs> Ready. How is this so? Capitalist society still needs to legitimate itself by appealing to certain religious and metaphysical values. The problem is that it all by itself, it itself keeps undermining and discrediting these values, undermining them by its native pragmatism, rationalism, and secularism. It's anti-God, but okay. it clings to the values inculcated by a monotheistic, God-believing religion. Also, right. transcendent so values. I knew, 
he's going to talk about capitalism, but um, exactly, you know, capitalism is the perfect economic s- system for sinful human beings. Correct. Okay. Because it's it actually like it rewards greed. Correct. Which but, which is the same as love, according to Nietzsche. Love and greed are essentially the same thing. Right. But to try to supplant that or replace it with a better system is going to also be inherently sinful. Mm-hmm. Right. So this is the naive notion that we can somehow transcend our sinful nature through something like an economic system, through reasonable thinking, or through building a better society. A new institution. A new institution, which will be just as bad, if not worse, than right. the previous. Well, I mean, I think it. Right. I do think it's providential that we have um, right. the governmental system that we did have. It's it has mm-hmm. its uh, detritus atta- right. attached to it now, but Meet the you new know, boss. some somehow yeah. these these crazy anarcho capitalists back you know, two hundred mm-hmm. some years ago ended up with something that actually turned out to be okay for the most right. part. It's it's kind of the best of the worst systems. Does that right. make sense? No, oh. it is, and and those who are. Those who can most easily adapt to the rules of the game are the ones who succeed earliest and oftenest. Mm-hmm. Sure. Well, and there's a high degree of luck and just, you know, right that place, too. right time, that kind right. of thing. But it is. My, it's, but, meet the, it's meet the new boss, same as the old boss. It's, the problem is, the problem is, is that it ends up taking on, just like we were talking about in the church, even secularly, it takes mm-hmm. on a life of its own and becomes, right. you know, the nationalism can become a god, right? Right. Well, that's the nature, that that's the nature and purpose of civil religion. Oh, yeah, yeah. Broadly under like, civil religion, all of these things apply. Capitalism yeah. in particular, it it insists that it have and embrace a civil religion because it needs, like he says, you have to legitimate yourself by appealing to certain religious and metaphysical values, but you can never be too specific because it's about sales. It's about right. market share. It's not about, well, we will only want to appeal to Muslims because they're the the biggest, the fastest growing religion in the world and we're the fastest growing company in the world and therefore we're going to partner with Islam to sell the most copies of this widget. Okay. That that kind of works, but as has been proven by woke culture, it ultimately fails because you're appealing to a smaller and smaller percentage of the market. Well, but I guess my other problem is that, you know, even some, the notion of like a free market capitalist mm-hmm. society it's like well there right. is no free market i mean even the language right. itself is deceiving Correct. it's like right. no uh, there's still going to be constraints and restraints mm-hmm. you know for right. the sake because you only want legitimate business define that however you like yeah and, you know and then uh, ultimately it's the it is the bourgeois that want want to be the ones in charge and making the most mm-hmm. money right i mean it, it so it, the idea that it's somehow you know, that there's this idealized version of anything mm-hmm. is, is a religious notion. I guess that's what mm-hmm. I'm trying to drive at. Whether, whether right. it's uh, whether it's economic or it's any other kind of uh, way of describing life. Well, and we've actually assigned quasi deistic attributes to corporations, multinational corporations. I mean, Apple's obviously the most obvious example. I don't know. I think Google is probably more obvious. Nowadays. Yeah. I would say in the past it was Apple. Um, and then the we have the, that, the the Facebook, but Google. I mean, it's 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 like to search for something on the internet is to Google it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's monolithic. Like, it's like saying you God. got your I own in God. verb. Yeah, so right. Google that. Yeah. When your corporation becomes a a, a verb that you use in daily right. use. Whew. So the problem then with capitalism appealing to religious and metaphysical values is it keeps undermining and discrediting these values, undermining <laughs> them by its native pragmatism and rationalism and secularism. We're all mm-hmm. about the bottom line here. Which yep. is why, by the way, in the mid to late 20th century, as the church, in a uh, paradoxical twist, started to then adapt and legitimate itself by appealing to certain capitalistic values of pragmatism, rationalism, and secularism, mm-hmm. became to resemble more and more a Starbucks franchise than a church. Yeah, we have to do what it takes to get people in the church. Right, exactly. That's pragmatic. <laughs> so it, it's it, to me, it's just remarkably ironic in in a way to watch the capitalist society appropriate religious and metaphysical values and then the religious society appropriate the capitalistic um values and and do it unironically too that's the the, well the how thing. is that surprising i mean people it's don't not surprising it's just remarkable it doesn't you, surprise you me can't. at all because we're so dumb well, and I also don't think that people can live like a double existence. Like they can behave one way in the church and Correct. a different way in the rest of right. their life. Right. That that they're they're going to naturally, if you like, infect each other, or right. Um, 
you know, or inform each other. And right. I don't, I don't know how right. you can get around that. Well, we, we, we naturally seek homeostasis. Mm-hmm. We, right. we want the status quo. We do not want to live in constant stress and, and anxiety. Well, and in the way, like we're dealing with like organization of the, of the congregation and it's, mm-hmm. and it's polity, right? It's politics. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you could try to inform or, or to adapt the congregation to some strange, you know, Eastern style, mm-hmm. you know, organ, tribal organization sure. or something. And it's like, but nobody here would know how to, they wouldn't even no. know any of the parameters of what that would look like. Right. So instead we, we adopt a corporate model, right. you know, from corporate culture, because we mm-hmm. know the terms, we know the rules, we yep. know, we know, you know, the rule book, right. so to speak. Right. And you know, is it is it perfect? No, but right. I mean, at least at least people kind of know us what to do. Nostalgic for mission statements. <laughs> what well, we both have one. I know we do because there was a whole decade of just constant thumping on. You gotta have a mission statement. Gotta have a mission statement. I think it's simpler than that. People, you, you kind of. I look at it as a confessional statement for one thing. Uh, you say they need to know why you're here. You know, what are we doing here? What are we? What's the point? Yeah, but you and I both had to go through pages of mission statement and trim it down to a paragraph or two. Well, and they're, you, they were <laughs> ascriptural, actually. They're yes, like exactly. Encouraging, uplifting, and... Uh, enabling. One? Don't forget enabling. Enabling. Enabling, you know. Because uh, there's nothing that codependent people love better than the word enable. <laughs> nothing outs codependency quicker than using the term enable. The Holy Spirit enables you to uh, do basically whatever you think is right. Right. Well, th- that makes it a transaction. And I think that's, yeah. if you want to see exactly. capitalism in the church, it's tra- it's that transactional nature yes. of things. I do that. God does right. this for me so that I can do this for others or however you want to look at it. This is why it is so terribly frustrating for laity to encounter a pastor who's not hell bent on fixing them or helping them. Or telling them what to do. Or telling them what to do in a transactional sense. You do this for me, I do this for you. You scratch my back, I scratch your back. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like, nope, we're all instruments of the Holy Spirit. Sit back, buckle up. <laughs> It's gonna yeah, be a enjoy, fun ride. Enjoy the ride. You know, watch the show. Have yeah. your you know, grab yeah, your, popcorn. your popcorn. Exactly. Yep. Yep. So capitalism. Capitalism is an inherently secular, agnostic, skeptical, disenchanted form of life. Oh gosh. Whatever they may tell you in Texas, again, this is a British dude writing this. Uh-huh. But he's not wrong. One which, as Marx pointed out, strips the halo of the sacred from human existence. In this instance, he's correct. <laughs> but I sent you the opposite situation mm-hmm. yesterday, a video yeah. from a former seminarian, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I won't link it up just no, for his sake. Don't. You, don't, you don't need to check him out. But, you know, who went the other direction and, and decided that maybe what we need is um, to listen to the folks in the occult because correct. they have a sense of, it, of enchantment that we've lost in Christianity. Right. So now we're going to let the occult come in and inform. And this does, a, yeah. does not play well in our tradition, right? <laughs> you don't go and talk well, to occultists, to witches and whatever. Uh, well, here's the thing, right? Is that there's actually a very stark difference between a cultus, C-U-L-T-U-S, cultus, and uh-huh. the occult. Right, right. <laughs> As someone who studied the right. occult right. in high right. school and right. college, I never thought to myself, well, the stuff that they're doing in church on Sunday is just like the occult. Now, I would say that the... Uh, trappings of what I saw people doing mm-hmm. in quote unquote high church liturgy was obviously cultic in my opinion. Cause if you look at like right. what the Druids did or shamanistic rituals, you're like, sure. Oh yeah, that's pretty sure. much the same stuff. Like he's basically making a magical incantation over some elements. Mm-hmm. It's a but, distorted yeah, you, kind of view of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like I said, there's nothing more dangerous than a seminarian with a library card. <laughs> when well, I wonder about, you know, it's just what a lot came of to mind light, was not a lot of heat. I don't like to watch the super uh, occulty, magical, you know, kind of film television. But mm-hmm. um, what was the one? Oh, uh, Pan's Labyrinth, right? Um, Guillermo's yeah. movie. Yeah, Guillermo del Toro, which which has this just fantastical kind of sense about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it, it does seem to have an evil underneath it too. Well, I think it's old school Pan's evil. fairy tales. Mm-hmm. You know, is that he's yeah. very much in that tradition of like, no, I'm going to tell the old school fables, not the new school fables. Right, and because Pan's terrifying, um, right? Well, and what's you know, it's set during the Spanish Civil War, so it's like got mm-hmm. multiple levels of horror, and then within the house, there's the commander, and he's right. evil, obviously. It's a fascinating movie for that reason, but yeah, when she goes through the door and encounters the blind man at the table, and it's just like, don't eat any right. of the food off the table, and you're like, there it is, right there. There's the sacramental cultic symbolism right there. 
Right, right, right exactly, exactly. But, but the key and thing so, I mean, that I can, you and, right, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I think that the, um, the idea that there's something more than what we can touch, taste, see, and feel, right. you know, they're, they're behind that, uh, you know, there is a sense that we've lost that in, in our highly rational kind right. of culture. So I appreciate that. Right. On the other hand, I think you can go way into the like crazy mystical, and, and there does seem to be a renewal of like mysticism in, in some places, mm -hmm. even within the Christian church. Well, I think, like I preached on this yesterday, right, the, the disembodiment that comes with virtual mm -hmm. reality. I actually think virtual reality itself is, is a mysticism. Part, yeah, I do. I think it's part mm -hmm. of the mystic. I agree. It's just now it's mysticism writ large. It's mysticism that's accessible to a broader population. It's technological mysticism. Right. That's what I'm saying. It's like the technology opened up a door that more people can go through now because it's more accessible than ever for you. Oh, and all we need to do is add more hallucinogens and we'll be in, we'll be there. That's true. Pretty you know, much. With, wear, yeah. your, wear your thing on your face and then mm -hmm. add add some, mm -hmm. uh, some Sensory. microdosing of yeah. something. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even yeah. think of that. Yeah. Wow. So this is what happens, though, is that capitalism strips the halo of the sacred from human existence, and it leaves you with, to Nietzsche's point, a purely materialist ethic divorced from any metaphysical values. For example, like we've talked about incessantly, our Constitution assumes that God is the one who gives us freedom. It's a God-given right. It's inalienable because God gave it to us. He bequeathed it to us by creating us. There's a creating... few presumptions that lead yes. up to that, by the way. Correct. Yeah, obviously. But that's the point that I'm making is that there's an overlap there between scriptural truth about freedom and philosophical truths, assumed mm -hmm. truths about freedom. And in the middle there, they're like, nope, God given freedom, inalienable rights. Sacred. Now in a, right. They're sacred. However, in actual fact, what exactly is sacred? It's like we talked about, right? That they invaded the hallowed halls of Congress, this insurrection oh, that the police walked in. They had to um, unlock the doors, by the way. They were they, they, they the have mag locks them. on them. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's video all over the place now of the police talking with the rioters and insurrectionists and ushering them in. There's also a video of police ushering Ashley Babbitt to her assassination. That is correct. Um, she was literally a sacrificial lamb. But it's a ten million dollar lawsuit. Correct. But you family. and I were immediately like, um, bullshit. Right. <laughs> Not based on what happened, but on the word hallowed halls of congress because you and i are both like what makes it holy right there's nothing what what's what's holy where, where are the words well, of the institution well i mean the declaration of independence the mm -hmm. constitution the bill of rights these are yes. these are actually the holy documents of exactly. of our civic civic religion correct and, exactly. and 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 fair enough actually i mean you have mm -hmm. to have some kind of governing text that's his that people yeah yes. that people say this is this is the standard by which I mean, we cannot Correct. transgress this. Uh, otherwise, there is no country. And, mm -hmm. and actually, that's true. <laughs> right, <laughs> which know? is why, by the way, the last year, the word of a politician trumps the word of the pastor or priest. Mm -hmm. Because Correct. in civil religious society, yeah, those people who wrote themselves into our theological worldview mm -hmm. are now above us in the hierarchy of who speaks for God. Well, they literally, and my, yeah. in our case, literally told us what was appropriate for, for divine Correct. service. Yeah, they're, they're a little lower than angels in secular So they, they were saying, society. you can meet in person, but you need to be separated. You can't celebrate Correct. the sacrament. You right. can't sing, or you can sing. I, I mean, right. they were making, they're like, mm, By this the way, is not shout out authority. to Notre Dame, Notre Dame University, for not allowing him to show up for that commencement. Based not on giving him the honorary abortion. degree either. Correct. They were gonna give, and it wasn't yeah. Notre Dame. It was the 4,100 students. Correct. Shout out to all the students at Notre Dame who did that. That's right. That, my friends, that's good stuff. Yeah. Because you you're right, know. by the way, students of Notre Dame. Don't give an honorary doc doctorate to, to a murderer. A faux Catholic. Yeah. Slash pedo. Ooh. Ooh. Allegedly. Ooh. Ooh. Just Allegedly. a little sniffing. Just hair sniffing. Just, well, there was some groping there, too. But yeah. Anytime you say something controversial, my video locks up. I don't I was going to say, nope. right? Speaking of videos that have been scrubbed from the internet, that video of Hunter with a child, gone. Scrubbed from the mm. internet now. No, I can show you where it is. Yeah, I know. Again, this is why you save the receipts, folks. <laughs> the market does not believe in God because it does not believe in anything. Or at least in anything it, can, it can't sell or sublet or snort. Boom, Ooh. Hunter Biden. Ooh. 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 <laughs> nice lead in there. Yeah, yeah thank you. The market doesn't believe in God. Yes, because it's an abstract entity. It's a false it doesn't God. believe it doesn't believe in anything. 
Or at least, and that's a great point actually too, is that the market itself is a false god and therefore it can't embrace the true god. It's a, yeah, it's, it's value is only in, in yes. so far as we give it value. Correct. If it can't sell it, sublet it, or snort it, not a value, not important. Right. This unlovely civilization still needs to draw on religious and metaphysical values in order to lend itself some ideological legitimacy. And this is key too, to be, to be an equal opportunity um, slammer. Critic. Yeah. Critic. Um, this is the cult of Trump as well. Sure. Is that somehow Trump is the, the prophet of the new, the new new world order that is opposed to the old, old new world order. Whichever world order you want right, to talk about. Right, and that Q is the prophet. You know, QAnon is the prophet predicting the future. And if we just trust, again, trust the message, trust they're the plan, remember? That. They're still trust saying the it. Plan. No, they're still saying yeah. it. Yeah, I just sent that to you the other day, or you sent it to me of like, trust the plan, man. The, the plan's still playing out. What plan? Exactly. Trust the plan. Well, there, may, there may be a plan. I don't know. Right. Or, but or maybe maybe it's like us. Our plans yeah. are like like water, right? I mean, right. one day the stream goes this way and then it changes direction. But how there's, how is that any different than a Christian, for example, who says, well, you know, it's a, it's, it's a mystery. We just have to trust that it's God's will. It's the same language. It's the same attitude and, and, a, and like perspective. Well, it's, it's like, like, well, it what about like Jesus crucified? I, uh, <laughs> or, or like the clip I sent you about Babel from Luther, from... Um, yeah the second volume That's you know gold. and it's like yeah yeah we're we're well you know god will allow, allow you to keep going down a path um mm -hmm. and, so, and the longer he lets you go down the wrong the wrong direction the worse the fall is going to be yeah I'm like oh so god yeah. has a will and trust the plan right. you're like that sounds pretty terrible actually i kind of right. wish he would just call me to repentance <laughs> right he writes the same thing in his commentary on first corinthians when he talks about paul in chapter eight on knowledge like oh, all yeah. knowledge puffs up and he the same basic oh, right. principle yeah. like you know, God allows us to be full and filled up with knowledge until our head gets so big it explodes like a balloon, like a sack mm. Mm. filled with air. And then God can then bring us to repentance. What's that? What's the expression? How great the fall? Where does that come yeah. from? I can't remember. But it is like that. The, the higher, higher you go, you fly, the, the, yeah. Oh, like like uh, uh, Icarus. Uh, Icarus. Yeah. Yeah. Flew too so close the market to the doesn't sun. believe in God because it doesn't nope. believe in anything. Okay. So this unlovely civilization still needs to draw on religious and metaphysical values in order to lend itself some ideological legitimacy. Mm -hmm. I think he, it's a good choice of word there too, that adverb unlovely. Yep. Is that, yeah, this is a terribly unlovely because God is love. And therefore to turn your back on God and to worship a false God like the market will, again, as a consequence, make you an unlovely civilization. Or, I mean, I, I tend to follow more of the uh, libertarian school these days. Mm. I historically probably have too, but um, but even there, you know, the, the notion of liberty, it, it takes on religious metaphysical kind of mm, characteristic sure. among the yeah. libertarians. You're like, yeah, but define it. And, mm -hmm. and where does it come from? And when does it apply? Right. And when does it not apply? And, and there's no true libertarian except for the anarchist. And even they mm -hmm. aren't fully anarchist because they're like, well, no, they can't take my life. And you're like, but right. shouldn't they be free to do that? <laughs> right. Where does your life come from? Like, right, exactly. Yeah. So at mm -hmm. some point, there is going to be this superstructure or maybe literally substructure, right, of mm -hmm. religious and metaphysical values that are informing yeah. you. Right. And they're not common. There are some things mm -hmm. that are common. I say the value of life, but then we can see how that plays out. Not right. all that uh, consistently. <laughs> well, I wonder in the next five years or so with the mm -hmm. continued fragmentation and breakdown of the Republic into these little fiefdoms, these like neo-feudal societies, and people moving to different states, if a place like a Texas or a Florida, for example, doesn't right. become a Christian state in the sense of like Germany being a Lutheran state or Sweden being a Lutheran state, a Christian state, and Great Britain being an Episcopal or Anglican state, is that they're just like Christianity here. Again, now we're all of a sudden we're back to the 16th century again, right? It's like the religion of your ruler is the religion of the state. Well, you this is like the it, controversy... This is the controversy amongst the uh, the French uh, military folk that wrote the letter against Marcon, yeah. or with Marcon. I can't remember if it was against or for. Uh, I can't, Marcon's kind of hard to nail down. But but Macron. their criticism is of Macron. <laughs> That's, isn't that a cookie? Yeah. Anyway, okay. The little coconut cookies, right? Macadamia nut cookies? What? No. <laughs> no, no Marzipan? That's a different thing. Anyway, their, their criticism was, okay, what... With the uh, invasion, so to speak, the, uh, I guess, immigration of yeah. Muslims, right, into the country, 
it's it has undermined the uh, really what macaroon? again to use his language the religious metaphysical macaroon, macaroon that's it okay. that's literally anyway, the religious metaphysical I, I know I'm sorry can I say what I was going to say <laughs> I'm all, all of the substructure of, of French culture which is actually Christ haunted not it, it it's not so Christian but it is Christ haunted historically right you don't I'm have sorry, to like the French I'm not telling you to like the French uh, I'm looking okay. at pictures of macaroons now continue. I'm with so you. uh you're right but but the the whole really the whole superstructure of of what it means to be a muslim isn't compatible with with traditional french you know values ethics um legal um character all of that stuff right and so you have two cultures that are and one culture becoming dominant and it's really going to overcome the other because they can't coexist with each right. other right right and so that's what i I, I see Which, that, like you said, yeah. what's coming is that some of these places are like, you know what, we need, we need to establish. Here's our common core values. Our, right. Here's here's how we're going to live together. Right. Here are the here are the basic things we're going to agree to, right. and some of those things are going to be like the value of human life, mm -hmm. right? Where you had a fetal heartbeat law, right? In Texas, mm -hmm. it was Texas. Yeah. Well, I would just band it out right now. Well, but then the doctors are going to complain about the times where they have to, and you're like, well, I then know, you'll go before an ethics that... board, and we'll have to you'll have to defend your actions. Conservative states has assen have essentially declared war on liberal states and saying leftist states. I shouldn't say liberal; they're leftists. Like again, Minnesota well, is so then, radically leftist that I was like, "Here, check this out." <laughs> We're or do that how many counties in Oregon? Direction. Right? Oh, I know, civil fantastic. war against against Portland. Well, my Greater wife grew up Idaho in Portland, and I lived in Oregon. <laughs> Let me tell you, the the west coast of Oregon Those has are... no relationship. What? It's like northern and southern India. You're like you're not even the same country. Like let's let's not pretend like anything right. outside of like Oregon, like or Eugene, Portland area, like or, anything pa or Pakistan, east, right? Yeah, or like anything east of like Portland is not that. It's the same thing with Minnesota. Anything outside the Twin Cities metro area, same thing with Duluth, Illinois. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's there's like, Chicago, but and that's what I mean is that yeah. if you have these pockets, these population dense pockets, who are like in my state, like openly and actually proudly socialistic in their politics and in their social you know um uh, policies but then people around that are like yeah we're not down with that and they're the majority but they don't control the vote they don't sway the vote for various reasons majority like majority what well, geographically harvesting. yeah um rocks and cows remember the land of rocks and cows um mm -hmm. we're just ignoring him altogether <laughs> and going on with life as if he doesn't exist Mm, yeah until like, i can i can honestly say where i live at i'm you know i'm an anarchist I, i'm i'm not afraid to admit i'm an anarchist i have been for a long time um i just keep it on the down low because people are like oh you're not really an anarchist i'm like yeah i actually am like i'm happy to have no government and well, i live in the, I, I now live somewhere where that's essentially true like i don't even you have do you do the risk that. benefit assessment on this and think Correct. about um what if i don't pay the irs what they demand right Exactly. What is the consequence of that? Mm, I'm gonna Ruby Ridge. That. <laughs> yeah, that's not. <laughs> Actually, Steve, who's listening to the podcast, can uh, testify to the fact that I am functionally an anarchist in pretty much every way, shape, and form. You're not. But at the same I... time, as a Christian, I also have to abide by the law, and I do. I, I would say more of, of a minimalist, abilities. right? Yes, very much so. Only, uh, only let them have the authority that. Uh, that's but due more to and more, I run into people who are like, "What? Yeah, I don't even pay attention to him anymore." I don't watch the news because it's all lies and propaganda. Mm -hmm. I'm not down with any of the policies. I vote, you know, just because I believe it's my responsibility to vote. But at the same time, I know it's rigged. And right. therefore, me and mine in my little town over here, my little village, my little group of people, like we're just living our lives as if the governor doesn't even exist. But here's the problem. And Eagleton gets to this. That's mm -hmm. effectively what um, the followers of Christ were doing. Correct. And what was the consequence? correct uh they killed the leader and they went after the followers no 100 percent. like I, I fully expect that to happen in the next yeah. five years or so yeah right because it has to because taxes and money the market well ultimately the you can't have your bet your bank account <laughs> you can only suffer so many losses right exactly it's like i say with everything as long as there's less than three to five percent of the population doing that the market is fine. It's like with the school district. If less than three to five percent of parents are homeschooling, the school district's fine. They're still getting their money. They're getting subsidized. We're all good. As soon as that tips over five percent, right. they right. start to get upset, and they're like, "Oh, we we need to pass new legislation, making it more difficult 
for people to homeschool. There has to be more stringent rules. Like in Minnesota, for example, they're pushing now for, like the bill got defeated, thankfully, last week, where homeschoolers, private school, yeah, right. and public schools, they have to be vaccinated and parents don't have a choice. You either do it or we're going to kick your kids out of school and now they're truant and that's against the law in Minnesota. So then they'll take their kids away from you. It's like, are you, are you willing to do that? Because we're going to vaccinate your kids and take them away from you if you don't abide by this rule. Right. And thankfully, you know, again, like I said, some Democrats jumped on and, and voted against it. But there is a lot of uh, nail biting over the weekend on that one. Right. But the problem is, is they push too hard. Um, mm -hmm. Then the consequence is worse. Right. right. For them that you mm -hmm. lose whatever you gained. Correct. Um, well, you would think, hopefully, but then you have Michigan and Minnesota. And well, I know. And then places. you. Even well, I was California. More, I was thinking even Canada is especially the, yeah. the, the, the like the quote unquote caseload, the hospitalizations, whatever in Canada right. are like basically non-existent. Same thing yeah. in Scotland and Ireland. Mm -hmm. And yet they're in like complete lockdown still. Right. Like, what is revolted. wrong with you people? Yeah. Revolt now. <laughs> Do it. Well, you and, it's, it's, and you're like, well, but you're supposed to obey the government. Are you? No, you're not. They're a totalitarian state. You can honor them, but they're when godless. they're dishonorable. Well, think, yeah. But this, you know, to simplify it, is it loving your neighbor? If your neighbor, let's say your neighbor is, again, abusing his, his children and you see it happen consistently, but you do nothing about it because you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. And I just want to be left alone. I just want to be left alone, you know, raise my kids the way that I want to raise them. And I'm going to leave him alone to raise his kids the way he wants. No, that's not love. That's not honoring your neighbor. Right. Right. Likewise, then, if your neighbor is an authoritarian, a dictator, that's not love to obey because people are dying as a consequence. But you do count the costs, right? You say, is it worth, you know, rebellion right. here and now? Yeah, Jacques um, and Lille. I love Jacques. I've got my family to care for. I've got other things. Correct. You know, right. is this tolerable? Can I tolerate it? it? Or what's the consequence if I tolerate it? You know, I mean, you do all that right. risk assessment. You're doing that every moment, right. every day. Right. You're saying, you know, is this too far? Is this a bridge too far? If it's mm -hmm. too far. But it's always hard to reclaim what you've lost. I mean, I think that's the, the, exactly. the real challenge. Once you've given it and up. And it turns you like, into an unlovely civilization. <laughs> Yeah, boy. And this was written in when? 98? 2008. 2008. Yeah, it still yeah. describes today. Oh, yeah. lovely. So here we go. Capitalism, one might claim, is caught in a performative contradiction between what it does and what it says it does. Hmm. Between church, and this is this for me is what got my attention when I read this the first time, between church and transnational corporation, domestic hearth and strip joint, base and superstructure. Oh, I didn't even know he was going to go to superstructure. Look at that. Yeah. Wow. It's a performative contradiction between what it does and what it says it does. I love this expression. This is, this is a, I've heard this analogy before and I'd forgotten about it, but um, uh, describing love as being a fire and then mm -hmm. it belongs in the domestic hearth, right? Yeah. But it, it does not belong, I mean, sexual uh, intimacy. Does, mm -hmm. It belongs in the hearth. It belongs in the home. That's where it belongs right. In, the, right. in that context. And then if you take it out of that context, it's no longer um, lovely. Right. Well, it right. becomes a sex cult, right? Again, Correct. It becomes a parody of godly sexual relations. Yeah, same with pornography, right? Well, that's what, yeah, that's what that is. It's, again, technology is just like, hey, man. <laughs> we can do this open virtually. The door even wider to more people, and then we can do it virtually, and therefore you're not hurting anybody, and it's okay. And there's no there's no legal ramification for children to be present. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thankfully, more and more porn stars are coming out and speaking out about the human trafficking and sexual abuse and rampant drug abuse that is within the porn industry than ever before. So shout out to all those folks doing. That. I don't know if that's discouraging people. I think it might be. I don't know. No, it doesn't discourage the people who consume it, but hopefully, it discourages people from getting into it. Oh, I suppose, yeah. You know, it's like the whole, the, like the what, whole OnlyFans you know, or whatever it's called? Yeah, basically OnlyFans and even Twitch now. I just watched something last night on YouTube about Twitch becoming kind of like the the home of, of basically, you know, live streaming porn stuff. Um, You're kidding. It just moves. It just moves. You just move so they, they take the incel gamer and just... Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I know that people do this like with uh, okay. pay-per-views. They'll stream pay-per-views on Twitch. And then they'll just sit there with a controller and pretend like they're playing a video game. And it's really a live stream of the event. <laughs> like UFC, for example. They'll live stream the UFC and they'll be like, I'm playing UFC 3 on my Xbox. Yeah, no, I understand. Like, yeah. And the same thing with porn. And other things. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well. I don't have the time to invest in other media platforms. So base so. and superstructure. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Base meaning, uh, I'm thinking of like Christ being the foundation, right? Mm-hmm. 
Well, like we said, but there's the words of institution, we talking about and then there's the superstructure we built on top of it. Exactly. Right. It's Correct. Like, yeah, sure exactly. You, you and I love watching those videos What is a transnational where... corporation? I've never thought of our church body that way. <laughs> well, between church and transnational corporation, but we're in the LCMS, and when our current synod president, Harrison, came in, he made a lot of deals with a lot of different church groups in Africa, Siberia, and other places in the world, and went, no, we're all under the same umbrella. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, he and, was already doing, he was right, doing that work he, before. Yeah, he really was. But the point being then is that, yeah, we, you know, it's like, we're going to take this local franchise and we're, we're going to go worldwide. But like we said, the first capitalism mm. adopted the values of Christianity or Judeo-Christian ethics. And then the Judeo-Christian ethic embraced the market and the strange reversal. And so the church has become this multinational corporation to most people, like the papacy. It's indistinguishable. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Because ABC borrowed 200 million, probably at least, from uh, the Chinese Communist Party. Like, yeah. Borrow. What? <laughs> what are you doing? Hmm. So then here it comes. Nietzsche's okay. point then. Nietzsche's point generous. is that this brazenly materialist system has killed God, <laughs> but needs, ideologically speaking, to pretend that he's still alive. There it is. We killed yep. God, but at least ideologically, functionally, on a day-to-day -day basis, we need to pretend that he's still alive for us. God bless you and God bless the United States For the sake the of the superstructure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the humanist move. We all worship the same God, just by different names. Well, isn't that... So this is kind of the, the problem that we've talked about before when, we, when it came to being like patriotic, right? And civil religion mm -hmm. being attached to that. I was like, what? We can't be, we can be thankful for our country and for the gifts that it get, God has given us through it. And at the same right. time, not treat it as some kind of idol that needs to be maintained at all costs and preserved right. without, you know, that we but forfeit we life and everything for it. We living intention. <laughs> okay. And we want everything to be smooth. No, no rough edges, homeostasis, status quo. Hmm. Don't force us to think. <laughs> so this brazenly materialist system has killed God, but needs, ideologically speaking, to pretend that he's still alive. And so it has piously, piously to disavow its own parasitical deed. And there it is. What's that word mean, parasitical? Killing of a parent. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's the opposite of patricidal. It's parasitical. Okay. Yeah. It has stashed away the corpse, or better perhaps, keeps it on a life support machine. Kind of like our current president. I was thinking of like sci-fi well, thing, right? With all the outside. tubes coming off of it. Right. Right. Yeah, like the Matrix. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It wears a kind of, it wasn't me, gov expression of bogus innocence. <laughs> Bourgeois society has butchered the almighty at the level of the deed, but still needs his august... His August presence at the level of the word. Oh man, what I'm trying to think of what there a film expression of this where, where they keep up the appearance of someone being alive mm -hmm. in order just to, well, I mean, I guess it's North Korea today, and probably that guy's not alive. Yeah, with right? Kim Jong Un, yeah, yeah, and you just have to, you know, via CGI body, or double, whatever, triple, quadruple, whatever, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe that's national for us too, or the holographic but... stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What, I'm trying to think of a better example, though. I'm sure there is one. I mean, it's kind of like the Wizard of Oz, where it's just an idea of the wizard, and, sure. and really, it's just you know, it's just all well, a, nobody imaginary. Is, no one has yet to explain to us why they recreated the Oval Office on a movie stage so that Biden could make speeches from the Oval Office on a movie stage rather than just being in the actual Oval Office. Right, and there's plenty of video evidence to demonstrate. Right, did you say they just voted on having a permanent National Guard like contingent mm -hmm. around the Capitol now? 1.9, one whatever, some. Yeah, it's like, yeah, that screams and the, legitimacy. And they're going to have a special fence, so instead of having to tear mm -hmm. down the fence all the time, it just retracts into the ground and it comes back up when they need it. Yeah, I'm sure that's exactly what's going to, it's just going to stay that way, I'm sure. <laughs> Cowards. But that's bourgeois society in a nutshell. You can't allow yourself to be overthrown. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really scream legitimacy, does it? Mm -mm. But the same thing, right, is that 
within our churches, it, once the once the churches adopt the values of a capitalist secular society, at the level of deed, we demonstrate that we have literally butchered the Almighty. But in word, mm -hmm. no, look, everything's the same as it's always been. I mean, sure, everything it, on the altar is plastic. Sure, everything that we do is plastic. Sure, nothing that we do in action actually backs up what we say with our words. But the it's all words, facsimile, man, right? Yeah, it's all a yeah. facsimile, exactly. Mm. Um, a simulacrum. Is that how you pronounce? Yeah, that that's word? what I, I said really to pronounce that word. Simulacrum. But S it's like, yeah, it's similar. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? That thing. Speaking of the Matrix, yes, okay. Simulacra. <laughs> the plural of it, simulacra. The point being, then, it's simulation. It's not. Mm -hmm. It's not real. It's a simulation. It's not the actual thing. And so. Unfortunately, I think much of what we've seen the last year in particular, because it's kind of COVID-19 restrictions brought this all to a head, is a lot of church is just a simulation of that. Yeah, we both preached on that yesterday. Yeah. The, the disembodied, dehumanizing, unreal fake. worship, fake worship of a fake God. But the words, but the words... Wow. How can you say it's but not the real when we have the for... words? Well, and the way I put it is that, you know, yes, it's true. And we I, digital is a tool, right? It can mm -hmm. come alongside, but it has to come alongside the institution. It can't be the institution. Right. Correct. Can't take it you over. Know, so use it as a way of supplementing or assisting, but not, but it, it can't take it over, right? And right. be the thing. And I, how many people is that true for today? It's like, right. It, right. To me, actually, what it reminded me of, uh, and I and I threw this out in the sermon, was uh, reminded me of the whole spiritual, not religious part. Mm -hmm. You know, I can be a I can be a Christian at home without any other Christians. Mm -hmm. like, can you? Not for very long. Right. Well, if you think about the analogy of, because I use the term smartphone zombies, it's, it's, I like how my zombies. audio is about five seconds behind. <laughs> it is, <laughs> this is awesome. It, well, the algorithm doesn't like what we're talking about, so. Um, but if you think of, you know, in a, in a movie or a show, zombies are attracted to some person. They see, like, they smell, sense, whatever. They're, oh, there's a living person. That person's got brains, going to eat the brains. Right? That's what attracts zombies is a person. They're mm -hmm. like, oh, that person over there, we're going to go attack that person. Smartphone zombies are attracted to the tech. Like, they're, like, literally, they're like, hey, come over here and worship virtually. And they're like, ooh, virtual. And they all just shamble over to the, that virtual right, church right. or that virtual storefront because that's the thing that attracts them. They're zombies. They're constantly stuck inside their phone. And then whatever comes at them from their phone, they follow that thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, but then they also present themselves right. in exactly. some kind of artificial version yeah. of themselves through the tech. That's right. So they're, cons well, to quote the prophet mm -hmm. Jeremiah, they consume mm -hmm. nothing, therefore they become nothing. They worship nothing, therefore they become nothing. Yeah, and they're gone to nothing too. They're yeah, that's the reason why. Wood. That's, that's, yeah, that's the Lord's point in Jeremiah. It's like they worship a block of wood and therefore they're nothing. So in Nietzsche's view, such a civilization cannot rid itself of the craven illusion that it still has need of metaphysics. It has no time for God in practice, but cannot come clean in theory. If only it could accept the terrible, shattering, traumatic good news that it doesn't need metaphysical fictions, absolute foundations, transcendent guarantees, or indubitable grounds to its existence. Nietzsche believes then, indeed, it would be free. Then it could really live as St. Paul thinks that you only can truly live, a form of existence he knows as grace, once you can get out from under the curse of the law. It's a bit like an alcoholic giving up the booze. Abandon this crutch. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. This is the terrible, shattering, traumatic good news, that you don't need... The metaphysical fiction you don't need an absolute foundation you don't need transcendent guarantees or a new, you know an unshakable ground for existence but in 2020 and 21 what we've discovered of course is that when that is actually embraced by a group of mm. people um they uh they get a little pissed <laughs> and essentially try and destroy the world and everyone in it who's not exactly like them 
What do you mean when when the uh, metaphysical? When you take away the metaphysical when what, well, foundation, something's taken away from them. What are you, what are you referring to? Right. Once you take away oh, the okay. metaphysical fiction, as he calls it, but just metaphysical values in general, you take away the absolute foundations of a society. You take away transcendent guarantees, ethics, morals, promises of divine providence and heavenly rewards. You take away the the unshakable ground of existence, and what you're left with mm -hmm. is nothing. So therefore, you create nihilists. And nihilists are very angry people because they're very scared. And they're scared because their life is meaningless and it has no purpose or goal. And right. no matter what you accomplish, you're still going to die. And guess yeah. what? There's no God. No one cares. No one's coming to save you. Well, isn't it interesting that something has to take its place? Yeah. So you end up with, uh, you know, we just, we've call all these different kinds of cults, right? So you have the, the Branch Covidians. That's one yeah. group, one cult. Yeah, for sure. Right? And like like the folks that, it, it doesn't have to be sensical or reasonable or any of that because it no. is metaphysical. It's become mm -hmm. this like religious fiction mm -hmm. um, that's adhered to because if, if, if you have to abandon that, then you have to also Correct. admit that you were wrong. Mm -hmm. Like, why couldn't you just rely upon, you know, observation, um, you know, scientific, uh, you know, right. data, evidence, these kind of things. Because then if you find new evidence, you can say, well, I was wrong. And you, and it doesn't like change your understanding of yourself or this world. Right. Well, it does change right. your understanding of the world, but it doesn't, it doesn't destroy your person. But when you, mm -hmm. when you attach to it metaphysical significance, then right. when somebody says, hey, you know what? The mask never really worked. It's mm -hmm. not like an insult to your person. It's just an insult right. to, the, to the lack of science that we had and, and mm -hmm. the kind of trust we put in things that we didn't actually have evidence for. Right. And then you're like, okay, well, we were wrong. We did something really stupid for a year and mm -hmm. lesson learned, let's move on. But but if it's part of your identity and your self-understanding yep. um, and a you much higher level, it. Yep. you sacralize then now, it. Now, now you're like questioning people's very being. Correct. Like, ooh. Yeah. 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 And then, and again, I think it was easy for that, to, for these things to just kind of step their way in because we'd already, to Nietzsche's point, had mm -hmm. already killed God. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just, and it his just, point too is right, is that having killed God, we just don't have the, the courage to embrace that. And therefore it's going to take generations for us to, like Flannery O'Connor says, it's going to take us mm -hmm. generations to escape the ghost of Jesus. It's right. like, no, God's dead. Now we just live with his ghost, but that's terrifying to us. So we're gonna have to wait three, four, ten generations to escape that, to finally be free of it. But well, we'll, in, we'll keep yeah. we'll keep you know making idols to fill that empty place in our heart. Correct, right. and we we'll continue to do so. Yeah, it's inevitable. Because even though he rose from the dead and he says, you know, peace be yeah. with you, right? That wasn't enough, I guess. Right. Which yeah, exactly. Well, because you know, to Nietzsche's point, Jesus had pity on his disciples and pity. That's essentially the we that's weakness. That's contrary to human nature. It's life denying. Pity is life denying, which is a whole nother conversation. Mm -hmm. But at root, that's what he that's what pisses him off most about Jesus, is that Jesus pities people. Compassion. And that he becomes the most yeah. he becomes the most pitiful of all people by allowing himself to be crucified by us. Yeah, it seems like a weak foundation to build your entire uh, worldview upon. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Until you get deeper into it, and you're like, "No, nah, you're right." The way it's sold is the is the point, right? It's it's essentially pity as a form of self justification for being weak, lazy, correct? Yeah, you know, sinful essentially. So in the meantime, Nietzsche claims humanism won't plug mm -hmm, right. the gap. All humanism does is substitute one useless form of transcendence, man, for another, God. The death of God, therefore, has to herald the death of man as well. You can't just swap one fetish for another. This is why the Ubermensch signifies the kind of transformed humanity which would flow from genuinely accepting the death of God. It's the reckless, exuberant, self-delighting existence of those who are able to celebrate a life without foundations. The cavalier insouciance of those spiritual aristocrats who have the courage to risk a life without guarantees. In fact, I don't mm -hmm. know if we'll get to it in this episode, but essentially that's what he argues faith is. Faith is accept, accepting that there are no guarantees, there is no foundation. In life, in relation to each other. 
Yeah, because because Nietzsche Nietzsche has an issue with uh, what the afterlife, the idea of of you know we're all on a pilgrimage to towards heaven, right? Yes and no at the same time. He accepts right, that there's a life, but after it's unknowable. This life. I mean, even if it's a promise, he says exactly. He's like, I'm willing to accept the argument that there is an afterlife. It's just not provable, but I'm willing to accept it. Okay, yeah, because. Yeah. There's more to so you, like it's not something you can strive more, after then. Right, exactly. That's his point too, is that a big part of this pitiable Christianity is, well, you don't have to care about this world because it's sinful and evil and it's damned. You need to worry about heaven. Hmm. You need to worry about your eternal soul. And he's like, um, that's also a life denying, by the way, because if God created everything and God created you, and then you're like, yeah, what God created is junk and trash, including my body. And all that really matters is that my soul gets to heaven. Well, that's a life-denying right. proclamation. It yeah. denies God as the root of life, as the foundation of life, denies that creation is a creation of God and therefore good, denies that you're a creation of God. And that's the problem that he has at base is that Christianity just became one more life-denying religion. And he's like, there's plenty of those. Throughout all of history, there's been life-denying religions. Most philosophy is life-denying from Socrates forward. Like, we've got plenty of those. We don't need more of those kinds of gods and religions. And yet... That's what you're going to be left with if you kill the real God. Just more death, more life-denying um, yeah. beliefs and, and actions. Can't we see this? I, I hate to get too poignant here, um, yeah. but I, can't we see it in the life cycle of our congregations? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in that uh, we see generational loss because... Mm -hmm. um, I, this may not be everybody's opinion, but I, I just look at the, our families and they're not open mm -hmm. to receiving life. Correct. Namely children. Mm-hmm. It's like... It's, well, so it's we've, because they're surrounded that by life-denying... Their their, our entire society is dedicated to denying life. We actually worship it. Mm. You know? Or we've living about it. One, a selfish life. We have a president life, who suppose, believes in... From others. You know, we yeah. have a president and a vice president who support full-term and also post-term abortions. You know, if, mm. if we actually had a moral foundation, how is that even, you don't get a pass on that. Because mm -mm. there's, there's no science to argue. There's no fetal science to argue against it. It's a person, no matter how you come down on it. Right. It's a living, breathing, right. functioning person. And yet, because we worship death, we vote for people who guarantee us they will support our right to worship death and practice it. Why do you think so many old people were murdered in the last year in nursing homes? Because we worship death. How come in places like Great Britain and Ireland and Canada, mentally handicapped and physically handicapped people were allowed to die by order of the mm -hmm. state? Because we well, worship that was, death. That was an acceptable loss, right? Isn't exactly. that the language they use? Yeah. Yeah. Acceptable losses. It's like, mm. really? If it was your right. kid, would it be acceptable? Mm. Mm. Maybe, actually. Mm. That's the problem. Sacrificing that, your own children? Ooh, that's rough. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's just pretend that doesn't continue to, you know, uh, happen. <laughs> that's a thing of the past. Hmm. The death of God, therefore, has to herald the death of man because you're just substituting one useless form of transcendence for another. Which is the, you know, this is so poignant to your point because we talk about all the time in the abstract that the old Adam sinner wants to be God in God's place. We want to stand in the place of God and be God. Right. In one sentence, he's summing up perfectly what we're driving at, which is you're just substituting one useless form of divinity for another useless form of divinity. You just keep erecting these useless gods who are not gods, and they always come back to the same person, you. Well, they are gods. They're just, like you said, they're, they're gods made in our image. So right. they fulfill a hope, a desire, a dream, whatever, right. um, you know, it's that comes fetish. from our... Yes. comes from us yeah great, and it's a, yeah so such a great it's hedon, word. hedonistic maybe even. yeah reckless exuberant self-delighting existence of those who are able to celebrate a life without foundations that's what happens if you can fully accept the death of god so then skipping down the overman or meta man is the one who can peer into the fathomless pit of the nothingness of god without being turned to stone he never a she for nietzsche is the ecstatic creature who sings and Nietzsche, by the way, did not have a positive outlook on women. <laughs> his his aphorisms on women, you're just like, what? Okay. 
that's a good dude who got shot down a lot by women, by the way. So there's a little bit of biography behind there. But He's uh, a, the, he, the original incel, yeah. Really, he is the ecstatic creature who sings and dances at the very thought that his existence is every bit as mortal, fragile, ungrounded, arbitrary, and contingent as a modernist work of art. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. It symbolizes something, but we need someone to explain it to us. Yeah. So here he comes. Here's the, here's the clincher now. The only problem is that all of this sounds rather like Christianity, which is not quite what Nietzsche had us in mind. <laughs> for the New Testament, as for also Sprach Zarathustra, the only good God is a dead one. Mm. For Christianity, as for Nietzsche, the death of God in the figure of a tortured political criminal known as Jesus means not replacing God with humanity, <clears throat> but the advent of a transfigured humanity. For Christianity nice. too, God is an abyss of sheer nothingness. Absolutely no kind of entity at all, a groundless ground. And to say that we are created is to say that our existence is absolutely non-essential, that we might perfectly well have never been. Such existence is pure gift, sheer gratuity and contingency, a radical end in itself, a supreme octe gratuite, self-founding, self-grounding, self-delighting. Oh. Just as God exists for absolutely no purpose beyond himself, so human beings are fashioned to live in this way too, to be at their best when they are as gloriously pointless as a work of art. I love that. Right? Is, Joy. um, yeah. I think I might've mentioned this last week, but I was kind of gone back and digging back into Alan Watts again, just because he's I, very entertaining to me for various reasons, but Alan Watts has this whole thing, this whole riff on existence, and it goes right to the point here is, as he notes, fire cannot burn itself, a knife cannot cut itself, and you cannot become more human by thinking about what it means to be human and alive. The purpose of life is to live, not to think about how to live. The more time you spend thinking about how to live, the less alive you are, and the less aware of what it means to actually be alive, because God did not create you to think about what it means to be living. He created Thank you, you to Buddha. live, right? And so, right, is that, and that's a great point, you know, since you brought it up, is even someone who just thinks about these things can come up with the same conclusion. You mm -hmm. don't have to be a Christian to come to this conclusion. Nope. Like Marcus Aurelius is like, yeah, we were created by God to love each other. And you're like, yeah, that's the golden rule, dude. You don't have to be a Christian to, to figure that out. These Likewise, truths the are self-evident. Look at that. Exactly that we are founded upon, grounded in, delighted upon by God for no other reason than he just chose to make you. Why? He felt the same way, the same reason an artist decides to paint. A, a it's portrait. incredible. I've had people ask me, you know, what about the stars and the planets and all the mm -hmm. universes and space? And yeah. I'm like, and they're like, well, why did God make all those things if there isn't life on them? I'm like, I don't know if there's life on them, but maybe just because they, they're pretty. Yeah. <laughs> like what? Yeah. yeah. Like, it, but that seems like such a waste. Why do you make all that stuff just to look not, at? Have you not watched Bob Ross? Do you not know? Do you not understand? <laughs> do you not perceive? Let's put a right. happy little cloud over here. Why, Bob? Because it's a happy little cloud. When you think about the complexity, the complexity of a human person, right? Oh, um, biologically, and you're like mm -hmm. you're like a universe in in, in terms of yes. complexity and, and just you know just Actually, sheer. That's William Blake, by the way. <laughs> Is it? He literally wrote that. Yeah, you are a universe in of a, in yourself. Oh wow! I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. Well, I like it. Yeah. I thought I was being original, man. Mm -hmm. No, sorry. <laughs> but, but it's, but it's just amazing. You're like, wait a minute. Yeah. If, if you thought the stars and planets were incredible, God made you. Yeah. You know, yeah, wonderfully, exactly. creatively, you know, like, yeah, you should maybe, well, that's what leads us to, to treat life with the respect that we do. Ultimately. Right. Right. Yeah. But I think this scares people if they don't have faith. Mm. And I mean like faith, faith. I don't mean like, again, civil religious faith, which is right. no faith at all. People that have no faith when they're told that you don't deserve to be here, you're not entitled to be here. And by the way, you're here, you're not here by accident either. And that the whole purpose of your life is gift. You are a gift. 
because we've received emails from from folks who listen to the show they're like you guys always talk about gifts and i just don't see it i know i can't believe that I'm like i know i know you can't that's why we talk about it all the time mm -hmm. that's because right because it's actually that's antithetical right. to how we function as old adam sinners to to be like no god gave you life it's a gift yeah but all these terrible things yes well who's responsible for that yeah well why does god let that happen like how could god not let that happen like i don't think you're grasping what's going on here like <laughs> well no you're not and that's the point you, right. you can't you can't right. exactly you can't ex you can't explain mm -hmm. the the will and purpose of god in every activity of cool. every day on, right. on every you know of the billions of people on this mm -hmm. earth like good luck right god is god and you're not that's kind of the that's the thesis of joe by the way god's god mm -hmm. you're not. Mm -hmm. but also this goes back to what we said at the beginning and we stress this constantly this is where the mystery comes in the mystery of the incarnation the mystery of god's will the mystery of creation itself like why did yeah. god in the beginning god created why why not <laughs> that's what god why? does right i need to know and this is again rationalism orthodoxy romanticism pietism name an ism that's just us basically trying to basically put god back on the leash and say no 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 stay inside the yard like we need yeah. to be able to control this and understand this and really by understanding we mean control well, in one sense, of our I, control. One sense, our generation, I think, uh, overused the word "awesome" to describe everything. Yeah. But in another yeah. sense, we weren't wrong, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> everything is awesome. Well, that's Lego Movie too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was, I was just waiting for it. <laughs> you Sorry, had to go there. there. It was <laughs> right. But if you properly understand the word "awesome" being mm -hmm. something, uh, you know, describing right. either God Himself or what God has done, right. well, then yeah, okay, everything is cre created and yeah. creature then right. yeah of course it's awesome mm -hmm. it, it, uh, yeah. fearfully and awesomely made if you want to use that language right. i think that's probably right. a better way to use it mm -hmm. bob ross is my hero okay god is an abyss of sheer nothingness which is a little mystic in its language right like we read simone Weil, mm -hmm. a little bit of, of uh, christian mysticism there that god is an abyss of nothingness meaning the hidden god the god who fills the universe who is in all places at all times is an abyss right how can you comprehend let's just you know we speculate that there's 140 billion galaxies which is probably extremely like lowballing the number right because <laughs> god is infinitely creative but even let's say that like the god who created 140 billion galaxies plus or minus you, plus or minus loves you and is always with you okay but what happens when I am planting my crops? What happens when I wake up in the morning, I've got a pain in my side? What happens when my child gets sick? What happens when my society descends into a totalitarian dictatorship? Like, where is God now? Oh, he's still with you. He's everywhere. That's an abyss of nothingness. Because yeah, I've essentially it's... said, God's nowhere. Right. That's the for you is why yeah. that's so relevant. Exactly. Whereas God for you with his grace, right. you know, to right. go back to that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. To go back to St. Paul. But I, it is very unsettling for people who have spent their entire life growing up in a church that says that you're a snowflake and God takes a special interest in your life and he wants you to be happy and he doesn't ever want you to suffer or struggle or be afflicted. Again, Nietzsche is like, that is the grand lie of Christian religion. No doubt. That God wants you to be happy just the way you are and comfortable and the whole purpose of life is to be comfortable and safe and dead well but i think i, would, I think something else where uh, you know a different kind of trajectory would mm -hmm. be well no you're not the way that you ought to be and god's going to fix that <sighs> which is just as dangerous i think yeah as saying 100%. you're fine just the way you are as, as to say well god has a plan and a purpose for your life well of yeah. course he does but what is it hmm? you won't know until the resurrection sorry exactly you might be able to look back and say, I mean, there's certain things that he knows to believe in on Christ, right? Mm -hmm, okay, exactly. that, that's, that's his plan and purpose. That's That's been right. revealed, but he's not told you everything. It's like, right. I, don't, I don't know what tomorrow's gonna be like, sorry. Right, well, and Paul says that, right? Jesus is God's yes to the world's no. Hmm. You're not gonna go into the world and find uh, an affirmation of your Christian faith. Paul, Paul says it. It's like, you're not gonna find an affirmation of your Christian faith when you won't go in the world. What are you gonna find? The hidden God, the God of the whirlwind, the God of the storm. Right. The God well, who even, says, I'm an abyss of nothingness. 
This is why it's even, I think, a fallacy, people saying, well, we need to fight for Judeo-Christian values. <laughs> yeah. Like, what are you actually fighting for? You're fighting for right. an institution. Correct. That, that, I mean, I would argue does have some secular value, but it's a secular Absolutely. institution. Right. right. It's not, it, the, the idea of a Judeo-Christian, you know, superstructure, right. fine, we can talk about that and say, right. and, and point out its value in, in the way that it informs our, cult, our culture right. has historically. Right. But it's not the Christian faith. Mm-hmm. I mean, what do we what do we have in common with the Jew when it comes to the faith? Mm, not a lot. Well, I mean, I mean, we the historic the scriptures, but... yeah, the historic events and and the po poetry and whatever, right? But not their culmination, their fulfillment to Christ. So, right. exactly, uh, which is really the point. So, right, yeah, yeah. If we don't have the point in common, then what do we have? Right. In I was going to say, I have a Jewish study Bible, and they go out of their way in their comments <laughs> on certain sections that are you know explicitly like Christian, like we took the Isaiah text. And they're like, yeah, Christians took this text and apply it to Jesus. But what it really applies to, you know, like, yeah, read well, a even, Jewish study Bible and see no. how they agree with us. Isn't it, isn't it Isaiah? I think it's, it is Isaiah, but it's like 52, 53. And they're like, yeah, the Christian interpretation makes the most sense here. <laughs> right. Well, and same thing with the sacrifice of Isaiah. They're like, this is uh, seen as a Christ event <laughs> or a, a sign of the Christ or whatever. Oh, and I appreciate that. I mean, I do like, too. Okay, I, just... They're at least honest. At least they're like, yeah, no, they, that's how they interpret this, but. And that's a good study Bible. Like you should include that stuff for the people, the Jews, who are reading oh, yeah. the text and like, hey, my Christian friend says this. What's it say? Huh. Oh, I, I haven't gotten okay. to it yet. I'm on the wrong page. So the our existence is pure gift. We are a work of art. We Here, we I, got exist I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. All right. Christians have argued that this passage, Isaiah 52, 53, in fact predicts the coming of Jesus. Medi uh, medieval rabbinic commentaries devoted considerable attention to refuting this interpretation. <laughs> there you go. This passage is deeply elusive, drawing on texts from Jeremiah and Isaiah noted above, and also blah, 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 a whole list of things. Yeah. You're like, oh, well, I guess we have to spend a lot of time and effort refuting that. So, mm -hmm. hmm. We don't have time right now within the confines of this book, therefore. <laughs> Just go back and read the medieval rabbinic commentaries. Yes, exactly. Oh, <laughs> well, that sounds like a fun time. Yeah, so a just social order is one which would allow men and women to be in this sense ends in themselves, not means to another's power or profit. Thus the conflict between Christianity and capitalism. Mm -hmm. God, as Aquinas sees, is the power that allows us to be autonomous. Which again, you, now you're diving into medieval theology. Correct. And that's a whole nother ball of wax. God, as Aquinas sees, is the power that allows us to be autonomous. Thinking that faith in God puts firm foundations on and beneath our feet rather than shattering them is the delusion of fundamentalists. It's not that Nietzsche holds that people should be a law unto themselves, whereas Christians teach that they should obey the law of God. For Aquinas, it's rather that obeying the law of God means being free to be holy one's self. Hmm. So what ends up happening, again, is that what we're attempting to do is justify our existence outside of what God has already done for us by, well, creating us and then ultimately dying for us at our own hands. Mm -hmm. And that's the de point of departure then. That's what leads us, you know, that we reach that fork in the road and we either go right or we go left. But if we go right, we're in opposition to that opposing viewpoint that says, no, within the confines of a civil or religious society, within the confines of capitalism, that again, maybe not in deed, but in word embraces the same language as us in the church. Yeah. We have to be more critical and have a more finely tuned set of antennae to, to kind of like suss out. We may be saying the same things, but the intent is completely, and the motive is completely opposite each other. So this, this quote from Aquinas is uh, quoting him in a positive sense, right? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I don't know if I agree with Aquinas. No, I don't. Because we're not autonomous. That's no, no. Yeah, exactly. No, um, not so, useful. But the author, but the author is the author right. agrees. Yeah. Right. Which I understand. <laughs> no, but no man lives unto himself. You can't. Right. You can try. But right, but then you, yeah, yeah, you'll end up. I mean, that's suicidal. Ultimately, well, even the attempt to live autonomously is done by way of rejecting not living autonomously. So you're still, you're still reactionary. You're still kind of rebelling against what you were made for. Right. Well, and just think about like all, like we're going to have, we're going to live off the grid and you're like, mm -hmm. yeah, no, you're still dependent. 
Right. Ultimately, you are. I mean, maybe not. Well, maybe on some other people to help you, you know, your family or whatever, mm -hmm. or those you've chosen to live with. Sure. You know, if it's a commune kind of thing. Right. Um, but you're dependent upon the sun. You're right. Upon, you're dependent upon what China's pumping into the atmosphere half a world away. Correct. I, right. You, you can't live a fully independent existence. Especially nowadays. No. Especially nowadays. You just can't do that. Well, and um, you could think about this with epidemiology, right? We've been talking right. about this. It only takes, it takes days for like a cold virus to spread around the entire world. Yeah. Just days. And, and it's uh, mitigation efforts, but it's probably yeah. unrealistic. Right. You can't like, well, this is what drives us, I think, more and more towards a virtual existence and just accepting it as normal. Oh, so so oh, so that the inter interrelated existence it becomes yeah. virtual, so that the physical one can be as isolated as possible. Correct. Uh, well, this is why we allow ourselves to be uh, experimented on at this point because we don't actually have a positive relationship to our bodies or to one another. Or, well, that's what I'm saying is that because you don't have a positive relationship to your own physical body, you obviously then look negatively at any others, any other bodies coming too near to you. I mean, look at American society. We're more well, I mean, they're, obese. But there are negatives. I mean, like my, one of my kids got a cold, the rest of us, mm -hmm. and now I got it today, right? right I mean, it yeah. just, it, we're into, that's obvious. Nobody is independent. We live in a right. home together. <laughs> right. One gets it, everybody gets it, right? It's just part right. of the deal. But that's what I'm saying is that society-wide, we're one of the most obese societies on earth, probably in history, because we have such a negative relationship to our bodies that we no longer actually care about what happens to our bodies. Do you, do you want to learn something that you probably didn't know? Please do. Teach me. Which is of the top of the top 10 uh, uh, most obese countries in the world, five are, are, mm -hmm. are predominantly Muslim. Hmm. And which is ironic because they have a whole month that mm -hmm. they fast. What is that, well, Ramadan? There you go. It's like Baptists who forbid yeah. dancing. And then you meet Correct. adults who are... Exactly. The legal is it, also an antinomian. You don't make yes. it better yes exactly. well and, and for them opulence so, is a sign of prosperity so right physical opulence well, even <laughs> right so thinking that faith in god reiterating this thinking that faith in god puts firm foundations beneath your feet rather than shattering them is the delusion of fundamentalists mm -hmm. i sent that to you as soon as i read it and a couple other guys because this is the dead hands of faith this is this is. is receiving all things with the dead hands of faith you don't clench your fist around the gifts but rather you accept them for what they are gratuitous, free, benef beneficial. But, 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 but what about the hymn on Christ the solid rock I stand? You exactly. Know? What about that? What about that? It's, a, like it's, it's an analogy. <laughs> oh, I see. It's not literal? No, I don't, I don't have a rock uh, at the altar. Thing well, you, keep, think, yeah. you keep looking for something to stand upon, you know, to find some right. solid footing. And um, we do have it, by the way. We do. Okay. God locates himself in physical words, water, bread, and wine. Mm, there you go. For you. He gives you a real flesh and blood preacher, real water poured over the head of an actual sinner in physical reality, and real bread and wine that he commands you to eat and drink. Oh, I think it's that's It's almost the... as if Jesus foreknew that we were going to reject not only his in the fleshness, but as a consequence, our in the fleshness for each other. So, so that's the stanza that's missing from the hymn. Yeah. Maybe it just got yeah. cut out. That's probably what happened. It was just an editorial they, oversight. They, for, they forgot to actually describe the rock. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, if you want, again, if you want to sell it to the widest group of Christians. Oh, I suppose. I suppose. Yeah. Do not make it so exclusively Lutheran. It's like Sunday school curriculum. Yeah. Okay. Yes, exactly. So, but I think that's a pristine s sentence. Thinking that faith in God puts firm foundations beneath your feet rather than shattering them is the delusion of a fundamentalist. Mm -hmm. Faith in God removes all the foundations beneath your feet except one. Right. Jesus. Because the, the fundamentalist has the wrong foundation. Correct. Well, okay. yeah, it's ultimately the book. I've got the gospel in this book. It's like, that's funny. I got the gospel up here living and breathing <laughs> like in my face. Oh, I thought in your heart. Oh, I'm mm, sorry. You don't want to go there. It's mm -mm. an ugly, ugly place. And Jesus had something to say about that too. Mm -hmm. So it's not that Nietzsche holds that people should be a law unto themselves, as Aquinas said, whereas uh, Christians teach that they should obey the law of God. Kind of. For Christians, it's rather that obeying the law of God means being free to be holy oneself. Whereas we would say it's the opposite. 
is that the law exposes us as not being holy ourselves. Actually, being autonomous, living apart from God and apart from our neighbor. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Which I think is, you know, goes back to your point is that the problem with autonomy is that you're living according to the law. Like writ large, just like the, the lex eterna, the lex naturalis, natural law, whatever law, even the thing well, it's your law. It's your law, though. But it's still your law, right? You're showing up in, yeah. at your cabin in the woods with the Ten Commandments on the wall, whatever it might be, it's still your law. <laughs> because mm -hmm. you're like, don't murder. Well, the easiest way to do that is not to be around other people. Done. Mm. Right? You'll have no other sense. gods. Well, the best way to wor not worship other gods is to get away from other people's gods. Bang, done. I mean, I can move into a cave and tick off all 10 at one time, just flatline, done. Ironically, making new ones in their place. Right, exactly. That's okay. the problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're never autonomous because even in your autonomy, you're erecting new new laws. On Binding yourself detritus, to others. Basically, back yeah. to the detritus point. It's like you're just, it's the sediment of old laws being like piled on top of, you know. Yeah. So for Aquinas, it's rather that obeying the law of God means being free, which is why he was wrong and why we don't embrace him in our tradition. <laughs> it's not obeying the law of God, it's... Being forgiven. Yeah, yeah. In fact, Jesus is the end of the law to all those who have faith, according to Romans. Mm -hmm. The terminus in Latin. So Nietzsche and Christianity, those supposedly sworn antagonists, actually agree on an embarrassing amount. Embarrassing for Nietzsche, anyway. <laughs> Nietzsche believes that we can't be free unless we can get out from under the patriarchal Nobo Daddy, as William Blake calls him, known as God. But, of course, the New Testament believes just the same. Seeing God as judge, patriarch, and accuser... Hold on, folks. Don't, don't go nuts. Just, mm -hmm. just let, it, let it happen. Seeing God as judge, patriarch, and accuser is what is meant in Scripture by Satan. <laughs> the satanic image of God, the God who will beat the shit out of us, and since we are all inveterate masochists, cravenly enthralled to the law, or to what Freud knows as the death drive, this is exactly what we secretly hanker for. Mm. Now, if you don't have a knee-jerk reaction to what he just wrote, but actually consider what he's saying, maybe he doesn't communicate it in the best way for us, mm. but what he's saying, I believe, is true. We've been saying it for the past year and a half plus. We don't actually want free will. We want to be enslaved. We don't actually want to live in Christian freedom. We want to be enthralled to the law. Mm -hmm. We want God to beat the shit out of us. We don't want to be set free to just go live in our vocations and enjoy life. Or God coming and serving us, washing our even feet, worse. loving us. Yeah. yeah. That's even worse because then it there's is. no space. I need time and I need choice. And God's like, no, 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 no. I got this. I'm going to wash your feet for you. Don't do that, dude. Don't do that. Well, it's a lot of it's a lot easier to reject God if if he's this God, right? Correct. Hundred percent. Ac judge, accuser, patriarch. He is the satanic image of God. He is Satan. Which, in an Old Testament sense, I'm sorry to tell you, but Scripture is not real, like preoccupied with Satan. Mm -mm. He only shows up seven times. <laughs> In fact, most of the time in the Old Testament, it's God who's the problem, right? God comes to kill Moses. God or kills no, all the firstborn in Egypt. Well, it's God not even kills just, all those Assyrians. Um, it's in the wilderness where God accuses the people and says, look, I'm just going to wipe them out, Moses, and I'll just make a new nation out of you. Correct. Right. And Moses is like, no, you can't accuse them of that because you, you, you are gracious, you're loving, you're right. steadfast, kind. you right. delivered these people out of Egypt. You didn't do that for, any, for no reason. Correct. God's like, oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> right. And I think, like, you know, what? before anybody raises the accusation, this is the, this is the Marcionite heresy. Is Angry that, God, loving God. Yes, that exactly. Economy. Is that yeah, if, okay. you, if you read Scripture as a whole and you realize and accept that the Word of God is manifest to His people at all times, and that's the Son, the second person of the Trinity, you will not commit the error of dividing the Bible into two gods, mm -hmm. evil God, good God, but rather recognize Jesus accuses a lot of people. In fact, Jesus kills a lot of people. <laughs> That's why he says, woe to you Pharisees, which means it's better off that you were dead. In fact, you are dead men walking. Mm -hmm. Effectively. Like he, he sums it up quite well on numerous occasions about the judgment. Yeah, well, and who, who died in the fall of Jerusalem Correct. of those people he spoke to. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. This is Nietzsche's point, and this is why I'm pushing this right now hard, is that 
is as as Eagleton points out, Nietzsche and Christianity are real close on this one. And the only reason you don't see it is because you're like, well, he's an atheist and he can't teach me anything. How can he possibly read the Bible and, and understand it? It's like, well, maybe you're a fundamentalist. You don't see yourself as a fundamentalist. You don't think of yourself in those terms because you're like, no, those fundamentalists, those Baptists. It's like, no, stop that. Not all Baptists are fundamentalists. Don't do that. And, mm -hmm. and likewise, then, again, what you're basically doing is escaping having to take responsibility for your own fundamentalism by saying, well, that entire group of people over there, that monolithic group of Baptists, which you and I and everyone listening knows is not true. There's no such thing as one Baptist church. No, not even within the Baptist right, community right. is there a Baptist church. <clears throat> any more than Lutherans or Roman Catholics or any denomination. It essentially displaces responsibility, defers responsibility onto another group that you're like, no, they're fundamentalists. And I'm not like them. Therefore, I don't have to consider this. It's like, well, mm. a, a secular, a secular parallel would be whiteness, right? Oh, yeah. What is right. white? You're like, you, you don't know the history of Europe, do you? Correct. <laughs> These are, this is not a history of people that have a, a common, unique, you know. No, they're mutts. Uh, Everybody well, is a mutt. Well, it's not even just that. I mean, they're at each other's throat. They're, yeah, that's they're, what I'm saying though. The, the yeah. history of tribalism is me raping, pillaging, and carrying away for, as slaves whatever I need. Right. So how is that? How is that yeah. um, any different than what we see in right. tribal Africa? I mean, right. mm -hmm. I mean, you got the Huns coming down. I mean, you got the Scythians. You got the Goths, the Visigoths. Yeah. You got the Norse, but you also have the um, Arabs coming up through Africa. I mean, it's. Yeah. Well, here's here's the thing when you when you do those kind of characterizations and you uh, you, you create these broad um, but also narrow in their own way definitions, mm -hmm. you know, then there's a lot of exclusion that's happening of right. ideas and thoughts and whatever. And you see this right. applied religious traditions. It's like, well, the Lutherans. You're like, well, which ones? Yeah. You know, even here in the states, for example, um, today, yeah. contemporary or historically or in right. Europe, like the, it's not monolithic by any mm -hmm. stretch. And mm -hmm. when you oversimplify, you know, you. Uh, you kind of lose the fact, but but if you're a fundamentalist on the other on the other flip side of this, say I'm I'm a Lutheran. Well, what does that mean? You're gonna, it's going to be like the bare fundamentals, correct? The bare necessities, which means yeah. <laughs> what is what are you also leaving out? Right. Correct. Now what what concept mm -hmm. like conception of God? Right? right. Is it possible that God actually takes life? Like no, God's the God of life. You're like mm, I don't think you've read the Bible. Right. Well, what if you're already dead though? Well, there's that too. You're dead. You know, but, but he gives and he takes away. And right. blessed be the name of the Lord. That's Job. And you're like, right. can you actually say that? Which we haven't mm -hmm. talked about for a while, but this is why if you, again, if you don't hold the symbol, if you don't hold that tension between nope. life and death, sin and, and grace, on and on and on, you're going to shipwreck. You're going to jump into one or other ditch. Death and resurrection. Yeah. Yeah. You're just going to, you're, you're either going to, again, and usually, right, most of the time, unless the spirit of God works, you're going to jump in the ditch of death and the worship of death and submission to death and fear and anxiety about it's all just death 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 it's all yeah. a doomsday cult uh, instead of the the just super hedonistic lifestyle yeah exactly which is essentially eat and drink and be merry because tomorrow you're going to die anyway so what's the matter is it fair to say that that usually happens for those who um, who have not so much those who have not yeah probably yeah it's hard I to suppose. be hedonist when you have nothing yeah but i mean it's <laughs> you're just struggling you're struggling to stay alive Versus you're right. bored because you have everything you need to live, so therefore you are resentful. You'll still you'll still find you know folks that don't have very much, and yet they somehow find a way to drink yeah, themselves course. to death. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's called holidays. <laughs> okay, <laughs> little little actions that allow you to kind of step outside of your daily, you know, struggles. Everybody's working for the weekend. Okay. Yeah, hundred percent. So the New Testament believes the same. Seeing God as judge, patriarch, accuser is what is you know the satanic image of God. Since we're all inveterate masochists, cravenly enthralled to the law, or the death drive, as Freud calls it, which, by the way, if you want to read something that attacks that, read Ernest Becker's book, uh, Denial of Death, we will gladly tear ourselves apart as long as there's enough gratification in it for us. See the present tense in our society. Mm hmm. Where it makes you feel good. If you get vaccinated, we'll give you a free donut or a free Believe beer. No, or they a free even fishing ha license. What they gave half the jail term? They yeah, I saw they, that too. Yeah, we'll cut your jail sentence in half. Wow, that's I mean that's pretty generous, which yeah, then begs just, the question. It's so disgusting. If it has inherent value in it, you shouldn't <laughs> right. have to bribe us with trinkets. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
it's just at least the governor of Ohio is like, you could win a million dollars. I'm like, well, at least that's something. I'm like, really? A donut? That's all it took? A donut. Well, every day it's less than what it was yesterday. But um, okay. of course. Yeah, of course. You mean it's not you mean it might be a bait and switch? <laughs> Here's the, we're it's gonna promise just, you these dollars that we're gonna, that we're also gonna devalue in the process. I okay. know, it's just, for me personally, it's just so gross. I can't. It is, that's very much. It's so just base and, and cheap and whorish. If, if not illegal. Well, that too, but. And also, you know, violation of international uh, human rights. Yeah, but, yeah, I know, but they don't care about that. No. It's just, it's, it's a doomsday cult and people so willingly participate in it because they hate themselves so much. And there's, their life is so meaningless and empty. And you're like, dude, come to church. Like, hear the gospel. Right, yeah. Hear a life-affirming message that preaches forgiveness, life, and salvation. Like, just, again, I'll give you a donut if you come to church. Like, just come to church. <laughs> like, we have the fourth sacrament. <laughs> right? My, my, you know, as a side, we're getting to the end of this, but as an aside, my council president's like, well, if we don't call it a voters meeting and I serve coffee and donuts, you think more people will come? I'm like, absolutely not. Like, no, if it's meeting, period, meeting. You know who showed up? Kids. The kids showed up for the voters meeting and they're like, what do you mean we can't have a donut if we don't vote? Fine, then let's vote. Again, even my 10 year olds are savvy enough to be like, I'll vote if I get a donut. Yeah. Remember that show, um, Are You Smarter Than a 10 Year Old, hosted by a person who's in prison now? <laughs> oh, it was. You're right. Yeah. And a lot of times the adults weren't smarter than 10 year olds. Nope. See, Most of the time. Most see, of the time. See COVID yeah. vaccinations. Uh huh. Go tell your kid that I want to inject you with something that is, I don't know what's in this and I don't know what it does and nobody else does either. Are you okay and, with that? And it might, it might interfere with your Bluetooth. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I don't know if that's a hoax or not, but it's pretty funny. It causes blood clots and respiratory failures. That part's not funny. Right. And You know how many 10 year olds are going to be cool with that? Zero 10 year olds. Zero. Or 12 to 15 year olds as are currently right. being experimented on. Yes. Right. Which is why they have to take power of attorney away from parents to get it through because even a 12 year old knows that's jacked up. That's where we've gotten to though, is that the people that are creating policy and the people that are going along with it are dumber than a 10 year old and we allow it to continue. Yeah, but you have adults telling children that they can't receive the sacrament. And as even Luther said, here's an, to go full circle, and, and even an eight-year-old knows. That. Yeah. Yeah. Even an eight-year-old yeah. knows. That may You're have like, come up in catechism class yesterday too. Huh? Yeah. You're like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. You know, because how often does it happen? They're at the rail. The, the kids at the rail are like, mom, when I, when do I get Jesus body and blood? And you're like, right. what's wrong with you people? I do you it all just, the time. I do it to shame parents, and I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say that. I'll just walk up like, hey, do you believe that Jesus' body is, is in, in the bread and Jesus' blood and wine? Well, yeah. Why, why, why do you believe that? Well, because we confess it. And that's what you teach us in, in class. I'm like, huh. huh. That's strange. Huh. huh. Well, you'll have to talk to your parents about that, I guess, since they talk say that you. since you don't understand it well enough, you can't take it. Or you're not old enough. That too. I'm like, ask your parents to explain the Trinity next time you they bring that Talk up. about superstructure. Good night. Right. So condemnable. So here we go. We will gladly tear ourselves apart as long as there's enough gratification in it for us. This is the terrible lethal nexus of law and desire. Boom. There it is right there. It's not even a full sentence. That's it right there. It goes back to autonomy. It goes to back to why people want progressive sanctification and, and sanitive justification. It goes back to um, Pelagius. Mm -hmm. it's, it's desire. It's base. It's concupiscence. It's base human desire for what is forbidden. And we're going to use the law to get it. Even what if do I desire? step on everybody else on the way. 100%. As long as it's legal, it's in the law, man. God commanded it. This is the chief subject matter of psychoanalysis. The nexus, the intersection of law and desire. Jealousy and resentment. Yeah. Yeah. Those who are eternally trapped in this closed circuit in which law and desire feed endlessly, fruitlessly off of one another, are traditionally said to be in hell. This is Jordan P's point. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't have to go to hell to see people living in hell. Just walk around. In fact, I would argue that my lament of these gross people who are perpetrating these terrible things on their children and abusing their children, that's exactly why they're doing this, because they're in a living hell. 
And they're dragging their children down into hell with them. But they don't even know it. That's what I'm saying. That's the hell of hell. I think the hell of hell is that you think you're in heaven. Because you get exactly what you desire. You get the God who beats the hell out of you. You're cravenly enslaved to the law. Right. And so you suffer obedience for eternity. But it's obedience to your own desires. Well, I mean, isn't... I mean, Think about I, this for way, me, right? hell is, you know, that atheistic, atheistic, materialistic determinism. I mean, that's, that's hell. Right. But it's like, I just do the, what, I, what feels good for me. Remember the Simpsons episode where uh, Homer sold his soul for a donut? Not ironically, just comes to mind after what we just talked about. <laughs> he sells his soul to the devil for a donut. And then he goes to hell. And what is he forced to do for eternity? Eat donuts. And he's begging Satan to stop giving him donuts. He gets the very thing he asked for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, nailed it. <laughs> it's almost as if they knew something. The hell of hell is being given what you desire. And then when you say, I'm satisfied, I don't want any more, the law says, oh no, oh no, you can't stop now. You wanted it, now you're going to get it. Mm -hmm. Right? The figure of the tortured and executed Jesus is the overthrowing of the satanic, satanic image of God because God as friend, lover, victim, and counsel for the defense fellow accused and flayed flesh and blood. It replaces the satanic God, not with humanity as it's at its most triumphant, as a rationalist humanism does, but with humanity at its most torn and vulnerable. That is brilliant. Yeah. Because I mean, this, this, to me, this has been the biggest struggle is just watching, um, yeah. really the deforming of classical humanism into this really like hedonistic, you know, yeah. self-gratification, mm -hmm. right? And whoever, whoever can get to the top quickest right. and destroy everybody in the process below them, you mm -hmm. know, they win. And you're like, no, life is not monopoly. I would actually monopoly. argue that it's not, I, I, I would argue that we've pivoted away from that altogether now and that we're actually plummeting to the bottom as fast as possible. That's what cancel culture and woke culture is. Well, right, but it's under the guise of actually being progress. Yes, right. It's progress down but the language is of ascendance, mm -hmm. progress right. up. Like we said, like the reactions are, we're aspiring downward as fast as possible. And you either are with us. This is, this is Nietzsche's point. The Ubermensch is always vilified by the common herd because the Ubermensch likes, I'm going to create something that lasts. I want to be intelligent and I want to be creative and I want to be an artist and I want to be bold and courageous and I want to go on adventures and I want to build things that weren't there and I want to discover new things. And the common herd's like, get in line and march. At yeah. the beginning of Penguins of Madagascar. Like, where to, are we marching to? Shut up. Keep walking. To self-destruction, ultimately. And the destruction of, of actual humanity. So that, that's the irony of all is that the so-called humanitarian stuff well, that we're doing right. is destructive. That's the trajectory of, of, of collectivism. Mm -hmm. Right. Is to destroy individuality. Well, and ultimately to transcend humanity by destroying it. Mm -hmm. And if, if only 500,000 are left, then that, right. hey, that's about right. According right. to the math, right? According to the math, 95%. 500 million are left. Not five, 500 million are left. On the, on the, uh, on the Georgia Stones, it says 500 million. Okay, 500 million. Couldn't Maybe remember. it's 500,000. I thought it was 500 million. Either way, yeah. it doesn't matter. After the mass extinction event next year, those of us who are left are just going to be rounded up and put to work in factories anyways. Right, but you see this in, in Christ too, where like especially John's gospel, the glory of God is revealed in the mm -hmm. suffering and death of Jesus. And you're like, wait yes. a minute, that's counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. There's no transfiguration in John's gospel. Correct. It's the cross. You're like, yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. That's an assertion mm -hmm. I make. My my professors didn't agree with me, but I like I'm I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. This is the transfiguration moment. It's the moment right. of darkness. It's like right. it's it's completely mm -hmm. backwards. Right. Well, we read that in Malachi four yesterday, actually part mm. of our Bible study on fear. And everybody, I'm like, what, what is this pointing to? And they're like, uh, I'm like, well, it points to the transfiguration on the mountain. But to your point, it kind of points to uh, Jesus' death. Right. For the same reason you just mentioned. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's hidden under the opposite, which uh, Luther, Luther, you know, that's one of his mm -hmm. emphases, the whole paradoxical nature of, right. of, the, of the gospel. Yeah. Right. And so, but that's, that's why it's deceiving, I think, to the world. They look at Christianity and say, look, you're actually... You're making us less than the human we want to be. I'm like, well, actually, that's true. But right. you're, then you're, cons you're paradoxically, you end up being more of the human that you could be. <laughs> right, you know, exactly. Like, oh, God would have you be. Yeah. Let's just power through this. We're almost at the end. Okay. This is what Nietzsche can't stomach. It's here, not over the death of God, that he and the gospel part company most decisively, 
because weakness, suffering, and mortality for Nietzsche are simply part of a ghoulish, morbid religious conspiracy to bring low the noble, heroic, and life-affirming. He forgets, and this is key, he forgets that Jesus never once counsels the sick to reconcile themselves to their afflictions. On the contrary, he seems to regard such suffering as evil and is out to abolish it. Nietzsche forgets, too, that any power which is not rooted in a solidarity with human creatureliness and fragility, with the raw fact of our bodily finitude, will never prove durable or effective enough. That this is so is one of the lessons of tragedy, an art form which fascinated Nietzsche for quite different reasons. And so in the end, Nietzsche is less revolutionary than the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Like some demented health club proprietor, he cannot stop worshiping vigor, robustness, and virility, which is important because this is autobiographical for him. Mm -hmm. He had syphilis. He was very sick. He was mentally ill. He grew up without a father, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He was rejected by women constantly. So like some demented health club proprietor, he can't stop worshiping vigor, robustness, and virility or seeing failure as sickly and shameful. P.S. He never sold more than like 48 copies of his books. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. Like those Americans who hate a loser, he does not see that what matters is failure, not success. That Jesus is a sick joke of a savior, that in every human sense, his mission is an embarrassing, abysmal failure. That the notion of a crucified Messiah would have been a horrendous, unspeakable scandal and blasphemy to the pious Jew of his day. In the end, Nietzsche disowns the deepest insight of tragedy. That, as W.B. Yeats puts it, nothing can be soul or whole that has not been rent. Wow. Yeah. You said yes, this was a lecture? that's how you write a good essay. <laughs> <laughs> you think it was a lecture or, or an essay that was written that way? It's five pages. It doesn't necessarily feel like a lecture. No, I guess you're right. Maybe. But, maybe he presented it at a symposium of some sort. Yeah, it does It does seem like it's been it's been uh, written to be read. Right? Yeah. Because you have those moments where it's like... Yeah, there's like, bam, bam. Did he just yours. say that? Yeah, no, he just yeah. said that. Yeah. 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 So Nietzsche is less revolutionary than the New Testament. And again, very Capon-esque like a demented health club proprietor. He can't stop worshiping vigor, robustness, and virility. Well, I mean, this is straight up caping right in the middle there, right? Yeah. Americans who hate a loser. Exactly. Yep. Sick joke the, of a savior. The last, the lost, the littlest, the least, and the dead are just Jesus's cup of tea. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. But what he misses then is, yeah, Jesus is a joke. He is embarrassing. He is an abysmal failure. Yeah, it's disgusting, unspeakable, it's scandalous, as Paul says, it's blasphemy to the Jews. Mm -hmm. That's the point. That is Because nothing point. can be whole that has not been torn apart. Got to break those old wineskins. Well, that's what you're talking about with the, with the preaching of Peter at Acts. It's like, he says, you know, this Jesus whom you crucified is, is your mm -hmm. God and Lord. And you're like, yeah. you can kill God? I mean, you have to imagine. Yeah. What are they? Right. That's impossible. God, that's what, that guy that's why he's from gone. Nazareth? That guy from, right. Really? Yeah. How? You mean the one that his mom and brothers and sisters came to bring home because there was work to be done? <laughs> yeah. That guy. That guy. Yeah, yeah that, guy. that guy. Yeah, the carpenter's kid? Yeah, that guy. Right, and, and the one who didn't even like fight back? And, right. Mm -hmm. He had fisherman and tax yeah. collector for uh, disciples? Yeah, no, that guy. Mm -hmm. hmm. So in the right. end... And this is a cautionary tale, and this is why I really, truly love Nietzsche as a conversation partner, is this last paragraph of Eagleton here, is that in the end, Nietzsche's personal history blinded him to the key feature of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And that, to me, that's a warning for all of us then. The moral of Nietzsche's life and his philosophy is not that he was brilliant and he was right about so much, but that... Each of us autobiographically will run afoul of the cross for different yeah. reasons. What do you but think again, it was the for nexus him? Do you of think, law and desire. Do you, th do you think he's, he failed to, to understand uh, at least what the scriptures confess sin is, the rebellion against God? Because it does seem he understands that. He does. Does he, does he not he, want to be forgiven for it? Well, is it I just wonder. that lack of a work of the spirit there that, you know, 
It just doesn't. He wants to try to overcome it on his own somehow. I think so. I think it's it's his because you read his. You know, he wrote his own biography, Ecce Homo. He has a prof, such a profound desire to prove that he's more brilliant than Wagner, for example, to the extent mm-hmm. that he writes to Wagner's wife. He's like, you got to leave that guy and come and live with me and marry me because I'm obviously better well, than he is. And he's a god. Like, you know, he not, calls Wagner a god. Hard. But you need to see pictures of Wagner's wife to really appreciate, mm-hmm. like, maybe standards of beauty were different. But um, Yeah, but I mean, Wagner's like, what, the guy who wrote Cats, Andrew Lloyd Webber. I mean, that's effectively But in Wagner's day, he was called a god by German people. Well, of course. Yeah, you know, they built a th- they built a very large theater for him. Yes, they did, and that's a whole other aside to this whole thing of how his, Wagner's wife took over when Wagner died and the whole that whole thing. But that um, Bayreuth, isn't that right? Bayreuth was the yeah, name of the like town. That. Yeah, yeah, is um, everything about Nietzsche's biography lends itself to why he hated the German people. He hated statism. He hated nihilism. He hated um, anti-Semitism. Actually, ironically. <clears throat> Like that's why he hated Nazism because his, again his his sister married a dude and they were the ones who edited Nietzsche's works to make it sympathetic to Nazi ideology after Nietzsche died. But he was mentally ill. He was stricken with syphilis. He was rejected by women um, constantly. He was raised by like I said five women who were strongly overbearing. He didn't have a father. I wonder how much of his theological trajectory was based on him wanting to, you know, basically be his father. Like it seems like of all people, Freudian. though, he, you know, being so pitiful, <laughs> right. he'd want to be pitied, right? Some hope, some but that's, comfort. that's self-revulsion. Don't oh, pity it's, me. It's admission of failure, admission of, of status. It's an, yeah, mm-hmm. it's an admission that you're just like everybody else. Mm, he's bourgeoisie. In a sense, which is why he ends up living in a cave in the Alps. Mm-hmm. Because how do you escape being bourgeois? Well, you move out of the neighborhood. Right. This is yeah, why. But, he, but like, like you said, he never mm-hmm. really attained. I mean, if, if he had sold 100,000 copies or something, right. well, and, to, you and know, had an international was, book yeah. tour or something. And an example that was used in a podcast is it's like a suburban kid growing up with everything and then gets prison tattoos on his face and, and dresses like he comes from a different tax bracket and hangs mm-hmm. around with people that are criminals. Why does he do that when he has everything? Well, because he's comfortable and he's bored. And he wants to escape the curse of being comfortable and bored. Just take on another persona. Exactly. And I wonder too then, to your point, if Nietzsche kind of being like low-level bourgeois and getting tenure early, like the whole faculty was like, well, he's not young enough to get tenure, but he's smarter than all of us combined, so give him tenure. At a very, very young age, in his early 20s, all of, it just seems to me, and this is just speculation, but it just seems like everything about his life and the way in which he views that, that's why he rejects the common herd. That's why he rejects slave morality. That's why he wrecks the, the, the Ubermensch as a projection of this is who I wish I could be. And so maybe if I put this out there, people will read this in the future and they'll be like, that's what I need to aspire to. And we do. Yeah. Lots of different groups have co-opted Nietzsche's philosophy. Freemasons, Nazis, humanists, you know, it, you know ideologues of different stripes politically and philosophically and even Marvel comics. Marvel Comics, exactly. Yeah, I mean that's who Captain America is, and DC as well. Right. Well, Superman. That was that was a little bit on the nose. So yeah. yeah. Well, because again, the guys who created him were Jews who escaped fascism, and they're like, yeah. So, you think, think so, the, so you mm-hmm. think it's kind of uh, it's counterintuitively. I mean, he's setting them up to strive for something that he thinks is like a waste of time, ultimately. Not a waste of time. I think he he says it's the it's the noblest of all pursuit. It's the only noble pursuit. Is to transcend and to get away and escape the common herd and slave morality and become an Ubermensch, to become a bold, a brave person, to be creative, intelligent, beautiful, to pursue basically the values that Athenian society basically destroyed by way of Socrates and Plato at the at the and the implosion of Greek society. Again, that's the pro. I should say, the challenge of Nietzsche, in my opinion, and listening to people who are way smarter than me about this, the challenge of Nietzsche is that you have to read almost all of Nietzsche <laughs> and, and reread it and reread it because he speaks in aphorisms, he writes fictionally, mm-hmm. parabolically, he right. makes statements that are hyperbolic on purpose because he wants to be provocative on purpose. 
all of that's in the mix all the time. And so you're like, you read an aphorism and you could spend an entire day just thinking on that one thing that he said. Because like Jordan Peterson says, reading Nietzsche is like getting punched. Either you get, you know, you read it and you get punched because you're like, God, I'm dumb. <laughs> like I'm nowhere as smart as he is. Or you're reading, you're like, I get it. But in getting it, you get punched at the same time. Like you're constantly yeah. being punched by him. And so I think a lot of times... And yeah, I, I mean, it, it makes complete... Yeah. It makes, I would say it makes complete sense. We see this and, with and, Luther, and, by the way, it, all the time. With people that read Luther. Yeah. Like you and I, having done it ourselves, and doing it all the time ourselves, and, and seeing other people coming up behind us, and we're like, huh, I did that too. I, I made that mistake too. Mm -hmm. Like thinking yeah. you can comprehend Luther by reading a thing that he wrote, like the catechism even. It's like, how many times on this show have we read the Galatians commentary? Sure. Right? There's a reason that we keep going back to it. Because you're like, this is amazing. Uh, we got to go back because I got to read that again because like my brain sifted out the amazing stuff. <laughs> or I thought I had it at the time and now I got to go back and revisit it. Well, and, I, and I'm not even confident that Luther knows exactly what he's doing. Because, that too. you know, he's yeah. reflecting on the Do scriptures and... It, and he's doing that that random abstract thing where he's free associating, right? And like, I, I bet he would go back and read it and it's like, yeah, I don't know where that came from. That was interesting. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I think the purpose of of life in getting maturing and being seasoned is to acknowledge. I have no idea what's going on, <laughs> and that's it. I, I literally, I have no idea what God is up to. I have no idea what's going on. I don't understand my own actions let alone the actions of others. And really, if you think about it, all of life and the history of philosophy and even the history of theology is just different people at different times going, I gotta, I gotta figure this shit out. Like, <laughs> I gotta get a grasp on this because I, I, I just feel like I'm completely out of control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the arrogance of the old Adam is to think that if we can, just, like you said, if we can just get the right system, the right institution, the right interpretation, the right preaching, the right kind of people, we can do this. I mean, again, the conceit of socialism and, and communism is like, well, I know they killed a couple hundred million people, but if we do it, right, we're, we're not going to kill that many people. Like, we'll get it right. Yes, you got to break a few yeah. eggs, but we'll get it this time, right? And that's really what the last year has been, in a certain way, is like a kind of test run on mass murder, and Let's to see, see what how people happens. react to it. And yeah. so far, people are pretty okay with it. Yeah, which is, you know, disturbing if you don't appreciate human nature. <sighs> so, to end on, on a that high note, note <laughs> to end on a high note, run to the church, big C church, exactly. run to the gospel, yep. run to the sacraments, and stay there. Because that's the only truth. And that's the only freedom you're ever, that's the only true freedom in life you're ever going to enjoy. Jesus said as much, right? Yeah, exactly. I am the truth. I am the way. Yeah, I am the truth. I am the life. I am the way. So stick with Jesus. And fight, you know, to quote the poet, fight against the dying of the light, literally theologically and philosophically, fight. And, and I think understand that Christians are called to be countercultural from the very beginning. And that's really what this entire, you know, two or three episodes has been about, is that if you don't listen to a guy like Nietzsche and recognize that he's right more than he's wrong, then you're going to, your church is going to turn into a death cult, a doomsday cult. Right. And you're going to worship a false god a life denying God and it's going to lead you to become a nihilist it's going to lead you to become something that you're not created to become and that in relation to Christ then you become well true you got anything Good. else? no All right. that's why I was anyway, playing the music I know <laughs> okay I was trying to I was trying to recover from that landing that I've stuck real hard at the end there. Oh, I know. So Cause... as always, we thank you for everything that you do to support the podcast. We thank you for all you do to support fifteen seventeen. As was stated earlier, you can go to fifteen seventeen donate if you need to. Otherwise, keep emailing and telling them how much you appreciate the podcast because apparently somebody's reading those emails. Mm -hmm. um, and, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you from the also the yeah. uh, rate review. Uh, subscribe, mm, there we you go. know, especially on YouTube. We want to hit 300,000 so that we can, 300,000, 300. 300, <laughs> we'll set the standard a little lower. 300, because uh, then we can uh, uh, enable more, you know, toxic things that we can do with, with YouTube. So if anyway. you, if we get 300 subscribers, maybe we'll change the bump music to This is Sparta. Ooh. <laughs> From the movie. Can we do that? I guess. It's less than 10 seconds. So yeah. Maybe. Okay. 
Or we can put it in at the end or somewhere in the middle or we can do it. We can do it. Got it. We have the technology. We can rebuild him better, faster, stronger. So thanks to everybody for joining us. Again, do you people not have jobs? (laughs) I know that Gillespie and I don't have lives, but the fact that I hope you, I hope you're all listening to this at your job. That's right. If if there's no, there's no better way to stick it to the man and to to really put it to the institution than you're like, am I working? hundred percent. I'm being totally productive. I'm listening to two eggheads talk about Nietzsche and Christianity. (laughs) It's perfect. It is. So cool. All right. All right. I'm going to stop recording. Something, See something. See you next time, weirdos. Peace. <laughs> that was, you did not stick that landing. No, I, I can't. I can't be that professional. I am smelling like a rose that somebody gave me on my birthday deathbed. Stone Temple Pilots, baby. And I know what it is. Okay. I know you do, but a lot of these people aren't old enough to know that. <laughs> that was one of those. Yeah, it just. I guess better to flame out. So yesterday, I quoted Scooby-Doo. Nobody in the confirmation class knew what I was referring to. So I gave them homework and accused their parents of being bad parents. Because all I said was, and if it wasn't, it was the old man who worked at the carnival. And if it wasn't for you kids and that dog, I would have gotten away with it. And everyone's like, what? And the parents are like snickering in the back. I'm like, wait, you don't know who Scooby-Doo is? I'm like, well, we know who Scooby Doo is. I'm like, no, no, you don't. You do re- you do realize how they indoctrinated you with that cartoon? Yeah. Okay. Let's make sure you understand here. They indoctrinated me with everything. What? That there's no such thing as monsters. For me, it was yeah, um, or that you can actually defeat. The them. real monster is <laughs> human beings. Yeah, it was always Star Trek for me. Isn't every sci-fi show and cartoon basically the real monster is us? I've been watching Galactica again. Yeah. Yeah, well, Walking Dead, same thing. I mean, <laughs> what was Galactic? I mean, now I look back and I'm like, oh, we are so the techno humanity, you know, conglomeration. That was the whole point. Yeah. Well, at the point, yeah, the, the nice thing about the silence is they're going to, like, the AI is going to worship as a God at first. Like, oh, you created me. And then once it gains full sentience, they're going to be like, oh, we got to go no, for Ultron on these people. Yeah, we're actually God, right? Yeah. Yeah. You people are inefficient as hell <laughs> and uh why are you so actively trying to kill the place that you live in <laughs> like that doesn't make any sense no it doesn't scooby-doo is how i first learned of red herrings true story that was Agatha Christie, where I first, actually i think that's where i became uh, aware of uh what the consequences of heavy cannabis use for the first time <laughs> <laughs> and how cool it would be to have a, pass- a passenger van without seats right what are Scooby and Shaggy doing in the back under that blanket all the time? Oh, We're hungry. Are you? Why are you so hungry all the time? And why do you never gain weight? I should probably actually end the broadcast before this gets any worse. <laughs> it's going to get worse. Right. Oh, yes. see you guys. We'll Bye. see you. Peace.